made this rectangular box and daubed it or caulked it with slime and with pitch. Now, do you remember way back, that's a long time ago, when we were in Genesis chapter 6, when they made the ark? Do you remember what I told you, the Hebrew word translated pitch, also translated? Atonement. Atonement. And atonement is in the blood. So here again we have that same picture that this little box that she builds for, for Moses is a place of safety, but more than that, God is in all this. And so she caulks it or she literally seals it with pitch, which is again a picture of the atonement because everything here is pointing to the work of the cross. Everything in the Old Testament is looking forward to the time when Christ would become the Savior of mankind, when he would bring in the true atonement. So anyway, she daubs it with slime and with pitch, and she puts the child therein and lays it in the flags or by the reeds at the river's brink. And his sister, which we're quite sure must have been Miriam, and she stood afar off to watch to see what would be done to him. And then verse 5. Do you think it was just an accident that Pharaoh's daughter came along at this particular... No, it's not an accident. Here again is the sovereign God using even a pagan young woman. And she comes along the river and she sees this little ark or this little box floating in the water. And at the very same moment that she spies it, what happens from within? The baby cries. And no doubt it was a cry that just, just tore at her heartstrings. And so... She saw it amongst the flags. She sent her maid to fetch it, verse 5. And then verse 6, And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. Now that's not in there just to fill space. That little weeping child, at the exact right moment, tugged at the heartstrings of this pagan Egyptian lady. And she had compassion on him, see? Had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. She wasn't fooled. She knew who it was. And then came Miriam on the scene. And then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women? Now, hey, those Egyptians weren't any more stupid than we are. <laughs> Did she know who she was referring to? Why, of course. Can I take it back to its mother? And here again, she condescends. And she doesn't say, Well, Daddy says all these Hebrew boys have to be put to death. She says, You go ahead. You take it back and nurse it for me. And uh, verse 9, So Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away, nurse it for me, I'll give thee thy wages. The woman took the child and nursed it. Verse 10 now, The child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, because, she said, I drew him out of the water. Now, in order to prove my point here in just a moment, let's go back again to Hebrews. You might want to just keep a mark in there because we're going to be using Hebrews 11 quite a bit in the next few lessons. This great faith chapter. Back in Hebrews 11, let's look at verse 23 and 24 again. Hebrews 11, 23 and 24. Hebrews 11, verse 23, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw or they understood, we read that in the last program, that he was a proper child, and consequently they were not afraid of the king's commandment. So far, so good. Now look at verse 24. By faith, when Moses come years, and he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now you've got to come back to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. We, we just have to use the scripture for all of these things because I think over the years I've tried to make it so plain. I don't want anyone to try to remember what I think. Once in a while I'll, I'll put it that way. Hey, this is my idea. I'm just projecting. But most of the time, I want people to see what the book says, because what man says or thinks doesn't amount to anything. That we have to be able to come back and uh, substantiate everything from the Scriptures. 
All right, now it says, when Moses was come to years. Well, how old was he? Exodus doesn't tell us, but Acts chapter 7 does. Come down to chapter 7, and let's just start with verse 19, because here Stephen, at this tremendous sermon, is reviewing all the Old Testament. And he says here in verse 19, the same, that is, the king that knew not Joseph, the same dealt subtly with our kindred and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair. You see, there's that same analogy that he was a special child. Not that he was extra pretty or had curly locks or anything like that, but that he was designated by God himself for a special role. He was exceeding fair, was nourished up in his father's house three months, and when he was cast out, that is, put in the river, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Now verse 22. And Moses was learned or educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Now stop a minute. Have you ever seen the Dalai Lama or any of the Buddhist monks in television news or anything? And have you ever realized that the only real education in those nations that are under that kind of idolatry is through the priests? That's the only education that's available. If a young lad up in Tibet wants to get an education, he's going to have to get his education under the priests. In the same way under the Buddhists, for the most part. Now, same way here. When Moses received his education in Egypt, from whom did he receive it? Well, from their idolatrous mythological priests. And so he was saturated with all the idolatrous doctrines and worship of the Egyptians. Now remember, he's only been in his mother's care until he's weaned. And then he goes right from their home into Pharaoh's palace and is now under that influence. Now that's why I want you back here in Acts chapter 7, because Hebrews said that when he comes to years, it was faith that prompted him to choose the Hebrews rather than Egypt. Now, how old was he? Verse 22, and he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, was mighty in words and deed, and when it was full, 40. 40 years old. He's been 35 years away from his kinfolk. How did he know that he would choose to be with the people of God? Well, we said by faith. But faith has to come from a word. Where did he get it? Those first five years. Now, this will shock a lot of people, but it's still common in the Middle East. Mothers did not wean their children from the breast until they were five, sometimes six years old. So, you see, little Moses, even though as soon as he was weaned, he went to Pharaoh's daughter, yet he was more than likely with his mother and his father for five years. Now, I think all of you know that what do our Catholic friends say, especially the priesthood? Give me a young lad until he is six, and he's a Catholic forever. Why? Psychiatrists now tell us that what a child puts together up here in those first six years are going to be the biggest influence in the rest of his life. So Moses, now then come back with me to Exodus, if you will. So Moses, in those five years that he was nursing on his mother's breast, believe it or not, it was more than just the physical sustenance but all oh, his parents were people of faith, and they had revealed to Moses that someday, someday, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is going to take us out of Egypt, and he's going to put us back up in the land of Canaan, because that's what he promised them. And Moses, by the time he's five years old, has that locked in. And that in spite of 35 years of being under pagan, idolatrous, and of all the, the sumptuousness of Pharaoh's lifestyle, Moses never forgot. Oh, maybe he, he didn't respond to it for a long time. But again, I always have to remind people, I have so many parents that get, oh, they get distraught. And I can see why over their wayward children when they're sometimes teenagers or 20. And, and I don't do it glibly, but I'll always remind them. You know, the book of Proverbs says that if you'll train up a child in the way he should go, 
It doesn't say he'll always stay with it, but what does it say? When he is old or older, he will not depart from it. So I tell parents, never give up. Because even though your children have been trained and they're in the Word, they know the Word, and they may stray from it during those youthful years, I think God will bring them back. And I've seen over and over where that's exactly what He does. And when these kids reach a maturity, maybe even in their 30s, they'll suddenly realize, hey, Mom and Dad weren't so dumb after all. And, and they'll come back to it. And so I always tell parents, I've told a bunch of them, don't give up on them. Don't, don't cut the lines of communication because what they have picked up while they were under your roof someday is going to start ringing a bell and they'll come back to those precepts. So anyway, now if you're back in Exodus chapter 2, Moses, having had all this put in his little mind by the time he's five and he goes to Pharaoh's house for the next 35 years, becomes the greatest man in Egypt, the great engineer, the city builder, the great army general. He had it all. And on top of that, he, w he was probably the economist. He, he was probably the, the chairman of the federal, uh, uh, well, I lost my word, for, for, the, for the banking system. He, he was probably, see? Huh? The, yeah. And, and he, was, he was in charge of, of just about everything in Egypt. And there was a lot of economics involved. Now, you want to remember, he had gathered everything for seven years in order to feed the world that then was for the next seven. And so Federal Reserve, that's what I was trying to think of. He was chairman of the Federal Reserve. Once in a while words escape you, you know. But nevertheless, Moses was a man of tremendous power and influence. But in the midst of an idolatrous people. Now let's read on. Came to pass when he was grown that he went out to his brethren and he looked on their burdens and he saw or spied an Egyptian spy, uh, smiting or striking a Hebrew, one of his brethren. Verse 12, so he looked this way and that way. In other words, to make sure that no one would see. He saw that there was no man and he slew, he killed the Egyptian. Now like I say, Moses was not some puny little individual. I think he was probably, like I said, one of their head generals. He had probably fought quite a few wars, and he was, a, again, a man's man. And I think with one blow, he, he put this Egyptian in the sand. It was that, that, that easy for him. So then when he realized what he had done, of course, and he had slain, slain the Egyptian, and he hid him or buried him in the sand. Now verse 13, And he went out the second day, or the next day, and behold, two men of the Hebrews are fighting, two Jews fighting with each other. And he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow or your, your brother? And the Jew responds, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Now right there it should ring a bell. Where do you get that very same statement? Well, up in the New Testament, when Jesus had presented himself as Israel's king, what did Israel say the morning of his trial? Who made you a ruler over us? And when the Roman authorities asked Israel, is he your king? What was their answer? We have no king but Caesar. And so see, all of this is laying the groundwork. And so they reject Moses. And they have nothing to do with him because... Who made you to be a ruler over us? Now, I think we've got enough time left. I told you we'd be coming back to Acts chapter 7. Come back again. Acts chapter 7. Now, for those of you who may not have done a lot of Bible study or reading, Acts chapter 7 is merely the sermon of Stephen, who was one of the six deacons that were appointed back there in Acts chapter 6, you remember. A man full of the Holy Spirit, and he also, as Peter has been doing and the eleven for the last several years, I think this is about seven years now after Pentecost, and for seven years, or at least six or better, Peter and the eleven and the other believing Jews have been presenting Israel with their king, even though they crucified him, God had raised him from the dead, and he could still be their king. All right, so here Stephen begins this appeal to the nation of Israel trying to convince them that the one they killed was their Messiah. 
And so he goes through the whole history of it, as I mentioned before. But now let's come back, oh, into uh, verse... Let's start at verse 9. Pick up the account of Joseph. And that's why I'm glad we studied Joseph at least a little bit in the last couple of three weeks. I trust that you're remembering what we, what we spoke concerning him. And so in verse 9, Stephen says, The patriarchs moved with envy, that is, the eleven brothers, or the ten, Benjamin was at home. So the ten brothers moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God is with him. And he delivered him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now, you know, this has happened so often through human history where a Jew who is foreign in a Gentile land, yet he becomes one of the top men in government. Another one you all know real well was who? Daniel. Daniel became the second man in the Babylonian Empire. It was overrun by the Medes and Persians, but Daniel survives and becomes the second man in the Mede and Persian Empire. And so it has been all through human history. Well, same thing happened here with Joseph. He comes in as a slave. He ends up the second man in Egypt. Verse 11. And now there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance, nothing to eat. But when Jacob heard that there was food in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. Now verse 13, I always have my class when we teach Acts, and how I love to teach the book of Acts. It's the most exciting teaching that I think I can do. But anyway, verse 13, and at the underline or highlight the word second. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren. You remember the account? You remember the brethren came down from Canaan the first time with their little donkeys and their carts to get grain to take back to Canaan? And who was the guy they had to bump into? Well, Joseph. Joseph knew who they were, but they didn't know who he was. And it all, and it shook him up. You remember that he, he set a banquet for them before they were to go back? And he set them at the table, the eldest to the youngest, and on their way home, they were all concerned. Now, how did that Egyptian know who was the oldest right on down to the youngest? How did he know? See, he knew them, but they did not know him. But now, as the story rolled on, they ran out of food, and Jacob had to send the brethren back the second time. Now, when they get there the second time, what do they find out? Who Joseph is. Remember? And oh, the great elation and how they wept tears in that final reunion when they suddenly realized that this second man in Egypt was really their savior. Oh, because he had the food that they would have never had otherwise. But on top of that, he was their own brother the second time. Now, come all the way on over to verse 24, and let's pick up Stephen's account now of Moses again. Verse 24, And so Moses, seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him who was oppressed, and he smote the Egyptian. For he, Moses, supposed his brethren would have understood. Now stop a minute. When Moses, in his place of power and prestige and no doubt wealth, and he approached these Jews out there in the sand, what did Moses really think that they would do? Well, he thought they would recognize him now as the one that could get them out of their slavery. And he was ready to. Now, of course, Moses was a little ahead of God's timetable, but Moses thought that surely he could deliver his people out of Egypt. And that's exactly what Stephen is saying here. He thought, Moses did, that these Jews that he had approached would have understood, see, that he was to be their deliverer. Verse 25 again, So he supposed that his brethren would have understood how that God by his, Moses' hand, would deliver them. But, what's the next words? They understood not. Then verse 26. 
And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again. He again appeals to them. And he said, Sirs, your brethren, why do you do wrong one to another? Verse 27, But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as you did the Egyptians yesterday? Then fled Moses. He left the country. Now, are you using your mind? Are you thinking ahead? When is all this repeated? Why is all this set back here in the Old Testament? Well, isn't that exactly what happened to Jesus? He came unto his own and he presented himself as their king. He proved his, creden his credentials with all of his miracles. I'll never forget some little things just stick in my mind. In one of my Talakaw classes here several, several months ago, we were talking about this very thing of why did Jesus perform all these miracles? I got one or two old retired, I shouldn't say old retired, but I got one or two elderly retired pastors in that class. <clears throat> and the one was sitting right there in my left, and I'll never forget his answer, and I'm always going to use it. <clears throat> he said he validated who he was. That was why he performed those miracles. He validated who he was. Israel should have known, just like these Jews should have known what Moses was trying to do, but they understood not. All right, as time went by, Jesus presented himself. They rejected him. They said, we'll not have this man to rule over. What'd they do? They killed him. They killed him. They rejected him. And what did God do according to Psalms 110 verse 1? God said, come, sit at my Father's right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. He left the world. He left the country, so to speak. And he is now like an exiled king in glory. But I always like to put it this way. Those of us who remember World War II, whenever a government went into exile, what did they wait for? The day that they could go back. All right, now that's the way I want you to picture Christ. He came to his people the first time they rejected him. And he went back to glory as an exile. But when he left, what in so many words did he say? I'm coming back. And that's what he will yet one day do. And then... And that's why I had, to, had you underline the word second. When he appears the what? The second time. Israel always has to have a first time, it seems, that they can show their ignorance. But the second time, they're going to. Now, let me take you back to the Old Testament tent to Zechariah. Verses that I'm sure we've looked at in earlier times. Go back to Zechariah chapter 12. And another one, I think, is in chapter 13. Let's look at chapter 12 a moment. We only have a few seconds left. <clears throat> Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David. Now, as I read this verse, keep reminding yourself of how they treated Joseph the second time. How did they treat Moses the second time? And now here is Christ. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. In other words, the one that they had crucified. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him. In other words, as those eleven brothers wept tears of reunion. See, that's the mourning that's expressed here. They will mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. Now flip over in just the second left, chapter 13, verse 6. Now this is all of his second coming when he returns to the nation of Israel in power and glory. And then what does it say? Verse 6, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? See, the wounds of crucifixion. Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded, in the house of my friends. Now do you see how all this ties together? Joseph ap appealed the first time, appeared to him the first time, they didn't know who he was. Moses goes out the first time, they don't know who he is. And Jesus comes the first time, and the scripture makes it so plain, they did not know who he was. <laughs> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with
Teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to have everybody back, and we'll just jump right in where we left off last week, and that would be in chapter 2 of Exodus. And again, for those of you watching us on television, in case there's some who have never watched this before, we're just an informal Bible class, and we just trust that you'll find a Bible and sit down and follow these references with us, because we always maintain it's the Word of God that counts and nothing that I can say or anyone else can say that can make the difference. But to understand what God's Word says is what I hopefully am attempting to do. All right, now you remember last week that Moses made his presentation to the children of Israel and had hoped to be able to deliver them. Remember that he had everything going for him. He was the second most powerful man in Egypt. But by faith, he realized that those people in bondage and slavery were his kinfolk and that according to all the promises, they would one day leave Egypt and go back up to Canaan. Now, I think the, the, the question came up maybe during our break time. Well, how did they know or how much did they know? So I, I got you in Exodus chapter 2, I'm sorry, but let's just for a moment go all the way back to chapter 15 of Genesis. It'll be a little review, but you have to know that all these things were in God's mind before they ever happened. And see, that's the beauty of prophecy, and that's again the uh, substantiation that the Bible is the Word of God, because God foretold things long before they happened, and then they did. Now, way back here in Genesis chapter 15, it's just shortly after he has given the covenant to Abraham that out of him would come this nation of people in which he would put, put them into a land and he would give them a government. He would be their king. And then, of course, Abraham said uh, back in Genesis 15, verse 8, he says, Whereby shall I know that I'll inherit this land that you're talking about? And so remember when we studied this, we said that God literally descended to man's level and went through the very rights of transferring real estate. And I always tell people right in the margin here of chapter 15 from verse 12 to the end, Israel's deed. Here is where Jehovah came down and actually carried out the right, R-I-T-E, the right of real estate transfer as they did back in the antiquities. Now, as he's going through this transfer of real estate, that is, deeding the whole Middle East to Abraham, he gives prophecy. And in verse 13 is where it begins. And he, or God, said unto Abram, Know of a surety. In other words, God said it, and you can bank on it. <clears throat> know of a surety that thy seed, in other words, his children's children, shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. He's referring, of course, to Egypt and shall serve them, they'll go under bondage, and they shall afflict them 400 years. Now we'll, we broke that down, that the 400 years is the sojourning, and not just necessarily the affliction, although it would certainly sound that way from this verse, I know that. But then verse 14, also that nation, Egypt, whom they shall serve, I will judge, and afterward they, the children of Israel, shall come out with great substance. Abraham, of course, is being told in verse 15 that he will die after a good old age. And then verse 16, in the fourth generation, they shall come hither or here. And remember, God is talking to Abram in the land of Canaan. And so he said, after they've been in Egypt those 430 years, they will come here again. And the reason being that he could not send the Amorites packing until... They had had that 400 years of opportunity to either clean up their act or get so bad that God would be fair in literally telling the Israelites to annihilate them. And so here it's all prophesied that they would end up in a land that wasn't theirs, which we now know as Egypt. They would go under slavery, under bondage, but that God would bring them back to the promised land. All right, so now if you'll come back with me then to Exodus chapter 2. And after he kills the Egyptian, he has to flee. After all, murder was just as much against the law then as it is now, only the results were a lot worse. And so, verse 15 of Exodus 2, when Pharaoh heard this thing, in other words, that 
Moses, the second man of Egypt, had killed an Egyptian. When Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. In other words, carrying out capital punishment. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, that is, to the east, out to the area of the Sinai Peninsula. And he sat down by a well. And then again, here is where I got to give credit to the movie Ten Commandments. I think they made it rather clear how that as Moses now fled to that east country, he met these gals herding sheep, and as they were about to water them, they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock, verse 16. And then verse 17, shepherds came and drove them, that is, the, the daughters of the priest of Midian, drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them. See, now there again. He wasn't no puny individual. He wasn't afraid of anybody. And so even these rough old eastern shepherds, as they tried to usurp the well, Moses chased them away, single-handedly. And so when the girls went home to Reuel, their father, verse 18, and he said, How is it that you're so soon come today? Verse 19, And they said, An Egyptian. Now underline that. From all outward appearances, from his language, from everything, what was he? He was Egyptian. My land, he'd been raised in Pharaoh's palace now for 35 years. But inside, what is he? He's a Hebrew. He's an Israelite. And so they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. Well, and then you know what, what happened. Uh, verse 21, Moses was content to dwell with a man, and he in turn gives Moses one of his daughters to wife. Now here again is the perfect picture all through the Old Testament. Joseph, it happened to him. It happens to Moses. And we've got other instances where these men of God, driven away from their original setting, will marry what kind of a girl? A Gentile. And you remember several weeks ago we pointed out that when Christ was rejected, and as I said in the last half hour's program, he was literally exiled back to heaven. And while he's in exile, what kind of a bride is he calling out? A Gentile bride. See, the, the church is predominantly Gentile. And so you have this pictured all the way up through the Old Testament. Now, even here, Moses, a Jew, an Israelite, but he marries a Gentile. Verse 22, she bare him a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. Now, verse 23, and it came to pass in the process of time. Well, do you know how long? Forty years. Forty years, because again, you go back to Acts chapter 7, and there, well, let's look at it. And for those that are watching on television, we don't want them to take anything for granted. Go back to Acts chapter 7 again, and we see Moses' whole life is broken down into three 40-year segments. Not counting, of course, the five years in his mother's house. But the first 40 years, he, of course, is in Pharaoh's palace as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. The second 40 years, he's now on the backside of the desert, herding sheep. And then the third 40 years, as you're all aware, he comes back and delivers the children of Israel. So in Acts chapter 7, we already looked at the one verse in 23, where it says, And when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit the children of Israel. And then drop down to verse 30. And when forty years were expired, there appeared unto him in the wilderness of Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire at the bush. Now that's the beginning of his third forty years when he will go back and lead Israel out and then in the wilderness. So he has three forty-year segments. Now then, come back to Exodus. Verse 23 again, And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. And the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried. And their cry came up to God by reason of this bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, I hammer that covenant into people constantly. In our Telephone class, we are presently in the book of Acts. And I'm just showing them, and, and, and they're seeing it. My, we had the best time Monday night. And how that everything that's happening all the way up through the Gospels and well into the book of Acts, 
is based on that Abrahamic covenant. And that covenant said what? I'll make of you a great nation, I'll put you in a geographical area, and I'll give you a king. But who would be the king? The Son of God, the Messiah, see? All right, now here it is again. God now realizing that it's time for him to move in according to his own prophetic utterances back there to Abraham. And so he remembered the covenant that he made with Abraham. He repeated it to Isaac. He repeated it to Jacob. And that covenant carries all the way through. And so verse 25, he looked upon the children of Israel and he had respect unto them. He remembered them. And now he's going to start making things happen. Chapter 3. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro his father. In plain English, what's his title? He's a shepherd. He's a shepherd. Now let me show you what this must have done to the man. Now because for all practical purposes he's an Egyptian. Now turn back with me to Genesis 46, I think it is. Genesis 46, the last verse of that chapter, and that will tell you, I think, without a doubt, what this did to the man Moses. And we'll see more of it in, in the verses to come. Genesis chapter 46, verse 34. Now again, you've got to get the setting. We haven't got time to read all these verses. Joseph is making things ready for Jacob and the other sons to come down into Egypt and dwell in Goshen. Now you want to remember, Joseph is the second man. He's not the top. So everything has to be, of course, with the Pharaoh's blessing. So now Joseph is preparing the family so that they don't goof everything up. And so he said, now look, when you get ready to approach Pharaoh that you're coming down into Egypt, now let's look at what the word itself says. Then you shall say, thy servant's trade hath been about cattle, even from our youth until now, both we and also our fathers. Now, there's a colon. So the thought goes back now to Joseph. Why is he telling him that? Because that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, so that you get Pharaoh's okay. But don't tell him that you've got sheep, because, what does the verse say? A shepherd is an abomination in the eyes of an Egyptian. Sort of reminds you of our old west, doesn't it? I mean, the cattlemen, the barons, you know, uh, they thought cattle were king, and I do too. I mean, I love cattle, and I don't like sheep. Now, I suppose I'll have some sheep farmers tall, uh, call me on that one, but <laughs> I just don't have a nickel's worth of time for sheep. I think they smell, I think they're dumb, and all the rest of the things, and I think maybe that's why God uses sheep as such an example in Scripture, because they are so stupid. But nevertheless... Pharaoh knew that, and he just thought anybody who tended sheep was an abomination. Now, are you getting the point? This is where Moses ends up. A shepherd with those smelly old sheep after having been 40 years in the pomp and circumstance and the wealth and the luxury of Egypt. Now, why? God had a purpose. Now, I'll come back to Exodus again, if you will. Chapter 3. So now as he's herding his sheep, he comes to the backside of the desert. Now you know what that really means? You know, we use the term boondocks. Hey, this is worse than boondocks. This is boondocky boondocks. This is way out in the wilderness part of the desert, miles from any civilized city. And he comes to Mount Sinai. Now, I don't know how many of you, or even on television, realize the geography of the Sinai Peninsula. I, I often have kicked myself for not making it a, a point to put it in my file, but back, oh, years ago, National Geographic had a whole center spread in the National Geographic magazine just on the Sinai Peninsula, in pictures. And I'll tell you what, it is the most rugged, the most wilderness country that you ever laid your eyes on. How the children of Israel even negotiated it is beyond me. So anyway, it was not a very nice place to spend 40 years. And poor old Moses is going to have 80 of them out there. So now he's had 40 years back there tending sheep. And he comes to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Now, I hope you all realize that Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai are one and the same. You know that. 
Verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire. Now, again, keep your hand in Exodus. i got to take you back to Genesis for just a second. Go back to Genesis 48. Because this term, angel of the Lord, pops up so often through the Old Testament, and I want everyone to know, without a doubt, who is this angel of the Lord? You got Genesis 48, and now Jacob is speaking in verse 16. Verse 16, where Jacob says, the angel who, what's the next word? Redeem me. In other words, the redeeming angel. Now, there is only one redeemer in Scripture, and who is it? It's Christ. See? He's Jehovah in the Old Testament, the Son of God. He's the angel of God, but it's always the second person of the Trinity. It's God the Son. The angel who redeemed me, the redeemer, and there's only one. All right, now then come back quickly to Exodus. And so the angel of the Lord, verse 2, appeared unto him in a flame of fire. So now who is in the bush? Jehovah, God the Son. Oh, they, I don't think Moses sees him here bodily, like Abraham did back there in Genesis 18. But the voice was still the voice of Jehovah. And we'll show that if we got time in this program, then certainly in the next one. So it spoke to him out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burned with fire, but it was not consumed. Now, this doesn't come from my own thinking, but I read years ago where someone made the comment, and, and I kind of tend to agree, that this burning bush was also a picture of Israel. Israel is constantly in the fires of judgment, aren't they? Everybody has always been trying to obliterate them. But after, what, 2,000, 4,000 years now, has it burned up? No, the nation of Israel is still on the scene, see. And like the burning bush, the amazing thing was it was burning with fire, but it wasn't consumed. And so also is the nation of Israel. Take that for what it's worth. Verse 3, And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord, Jehovah, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, now here's where it sometimes gets sticky unless you know terminology, now he turns aside to see who called unto him. What's the word? God. See? Now watch this. All the way through these verses, we're going to see that God and the voice, which is Jehovah, are used synonymously. And why is that? Because Christ is God. See? Now I, I'm going to emphasize it more and more because I've said so often this is one of the first signs of the cults. They do not ever, any of them, recognize Christ as God. But the scripture does. And here is another good example. Even though it's Christ, it's the angel of the Lord, it's the Redeemer, it's God the Son, it's Jehovah, yet he's also called God. See? All right, so God said, or called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Moses said, here am I. And then you know the account. Draw not hither, put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And of course, Mount Sinai will remain that way for quite a long time. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham. Here it comes again. The God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, why does the scripture keep repeating those three names over and over? So that it soaks in that all these covenant promises were repeated to those three patriarchs. And we cannot forget it. We have to keep that in mind. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, this throws a curve at a lot of people, doesn't it? Well, I thought the Bible said that if any man looked on God, he would die. It's said in the reverse way. It says, no man looketh on God and lives. And yet, Moses knew that it was God that he was approaching. But you know, there was another individual who said, I see God. You remember who it was? The most unlikely of people. It was Hagar. Remember? And she named the place that she had seen God. Who else saw God? Well, Jacob did. He wrestled with him. 
See, I have seen God face to face. And then they come back and say, well, how can that be? The Bible dis uh, always contradicts itself. No, there's no contradiction. It always goes back to what I taught way back there in Genesis. You remember I told you that the Godhead, the Trinity, is an invisible spirit God? The Trinity is invisible. No man has ever seen the Godhead, the Trinity. But who steps out of the Trinity and reveals himself time after time? God the Son. See? God the Son. You've got a perfect example of that. Have we got time? Go back with me to Hebrews. Hebrews is another perfect example of those terminology. In Hebrews chapter 1. I had to think for a minute whether it's 1 or 11, but it's chapter 1. It's just verses 1 and 2. Now, this is a lesson all in itself. Verse 1 says, God. Just plain, simple, G-O-D. God, the triune, the eternal, sovereign God. At sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, the Old Testament. That same God hath in these last days, now remember the last days in Scripture are not the closing days of the age, it's from the time of Christ's birth to the end. That's the last days. But in these last days, how has God spoken? Through His Son. See? Now, what have you got there? You've got the triune God in verse 1, but how does the triune God speak to mankind? Through the Son. And it's the same way in creation. Those of you who were with us way back there in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, what? God. But all the rest of Scripture attributes creation to who? God the Son, to Jesus Christ, who hath created all things by Jesus. In fact, it's right here uh, in this same verse, verse 2. Of Hebrews 1, whom he, God, hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he, God, did what? Made the world. How? By the Son. And Colossians says that Jesus the Christ is the visible manifestation of the invisible God. And so now come back to Exodus. I'm not going to have time to go into the I am's because I want to have a whole half hour for that one. But as you come back to Exodus chapter 3, now verse 7, And the Lord said, now you see this constant change in names of deity? First it's God, that's Elohim, the triune, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Elohim. Then it comes down to the God of Abraham, the same God. But now in verse 7, the Lord said, now, those of you who have been with me, some of you almost 20 years already, when you see that term L-O-R-D in capital letters, who is it? It's Jehovah. And who is Jehovah? God the Son. Who's God the Son? Jesus the Christ. So here we have this breakdown now in Elohim, the God of Abraham, but it's God the Son, it's the Lord who is speaking out of the burning bush. And so now he says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. Now, I'm, I'm a stickler for pronouns as well as everything else. When God back here in the Old Testament says, my people, who is he talking about? The Jew. And I think you all realize that now. He's not talking about those pagans all around Israel. He's talking about his people, Israel, my people, his covenant people. And so he says, I have seen the affliction of my people, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmaster, for I know those sorrows. I am going to come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land. You remember what he said in Genesis? That after 430 years, he would bring them hither, Canaan, again. And he said, by reason of their crying, he said, I know their sorrows. Verse 8. I am come to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land unto a good land. Now, you remember when we studied that Abrahamic covenant? Remember all the references I showed you that God promised them a literal geographical area of this earth, the land? Here it is again. 
and I will bring them into that land flowing with milk and honey into the place of the Canaanites. Now, you remember what he said back in Genesis 15? Israel would have to stay in bondage until the Canaanites' iniquity was full. In other words, they had gone so deep into sin and wickedness that God was perfectly fair in telling Joshua, who now leads the children of Israel when they come in, to do what to the Canaanites? Kill them all. Don't spare a one, not even an infant or an old person of long years, because if you spare one of them, they're going to be like a rotten apple in the barrel. What happens to the rest of them? They all go. And so this is the reason that God patiently let his own people suffer in Egypt so that the Amorites and the Canaanites could prove the worthiness of the judgment that's going to come upon them. The only part that's pitiful is that Israel didn't carry it out. And just like God said, if you don't cleanse the land of them, you'll go down to their level. And they did. But nevertheless, God says, now I'm going to give you the land that is occupied by the Canaanites. Now again, our politicians should realize that this is exactly what's taking place in the Middle East. God took the Jew out of Palestine as a result of their rebellion in the book of Acts and at the crucifixion. He had the Romans destroy the temple. But when he took them out, what did he promise? I'll bring you back. It's their land. And now we're seeing it happen right before our very eyes. God is bringing the Jews back to Palestine. The poor Arabs, I feel for them. They've got their homes there, their businesses, but something is going to have to happen because that land belongs to the Israelites and they're going to get it. How? I don't know. But I'll just bet the ranch that it's going to happen that these... Arabs and these Palestinians are going to have to find a new home because God is bringing his people back in order to fulfill the covenants that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thank you for watching. Through and it's good to have everybody back. My, we haven't lost anyone today, have we? Okay, turn back with me again to Exodus chapter 3. We'll pick up where we left off. And for those of you watching on television, I know some of you are just catching our program in the last week or two. And if that's the case and you'd like to catch up on everything since Genesis 1-1, you write to us or call us and we have VCR videos available. Very nominal price, six hours or 12 programs for $20. After one more taping, we'll have seven of these ready. Six of them are already out there, and believe it or not, they've gone to at least 25 states, and people are using these tapes in Sunday school classes, home Bible classes. Some are taking them into nursing homes, and uh, the response has just been unbelievable. So if you have a way of using a VCR, you contact us, call us on the 800 or write to us, and uh, we'll send you a table of contents, or we'll send you a tape for 20 bucks, and we'll stand the postage. All right, now let's get back to Exodus chapter 3. These moments are precious. And now Moses, of course, has come to Mount Sinai. He's seen the burning bush, <clears throat> and he draws aside because it's not consumed. And as he approaches it, remember, God speaks out of the bush. And as we pointed out in our last program, it's God, but yet the person of the Godhead who is communicating and who is actually there in the burning bush is Jehovah, or God the Son. And we're going to prove that here in just a little bit. In fact, this is one of my favorite lessons. I shared it with an Israeli young man, a high school superintendent with a master's degree back in 1975 when we had the privilege of going to Israel for 10 days. And uh, he was walking guard duty as the bus stopped just for, I don't know, what was it? At the Dead Sea, I guess, wasn't it, honey? And we didn't care about floating in that salt, salt water. So Iris and I just went for a walk. And we ran across this young Jewish fellow walking guard way out there, you know, where it wasn't anything uh, militarily that important. So he was all informal. And so he was more than willing to visit with us. Spoke perfect English because he had been educated, of course, in Boston. 
But as we shared, what I'm going to be teaching in this half hour, he was just aghast. And he says, well, he said, you've got the Hebrew 100% right. But he said, I've never heard it explained like this before. He said, as soon as I get home, he said, I'm going to get my New Testament and check this out. Well, from that time on, I was just more confident than ever that when I teach this lesson on Exodus chapter 3, down there at verse 14, you go back and tell the children of Israel that I am a sent you. And as you'll see before the half hour is over, that uh, we're not stretching any points. We're, we're just staying strictly according to the biblical language. So anyway, God has now told Moses out of the burning bush that it was time to deliver the children of Israel out of bondage and that he's going to be the man. Verse 10, Come now, therefore, God says, out of the bush, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I? that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of, Egypt, uh, children of Israel out of Egypt. Now, I pointed out in the last few moments of the last half hour, what did the Egyptians think of a shepherd? He was an abomination. And what is Moses now? A shepherd. Has been for 40 years. And see, this is, this is sticking in Moses' craw. He says, God, I can't go to Pharaoh. I'm just a shepherd. I'm an abomination to those Egyptians. And then, you know, he's going to say over in verse 15 and 16, I think it is, uh, Lord, I, I can't do this. I can't speak. And no, I guess it's in the next chapter. We'll, we'll probably pick it up in our next lesson. But anyway, why does he make such an argument? I can't talk to a pharaoh. I haven't got words. Well, stop and think, for 40 years, where has he been? With nothing but sheep to talk to. Oh, I know he's got a wife and a kid or two, but nevertheless, for the most part, so far as his public connections, he has none. And he, he's just become an old country boy who is going to feel completely out of place in Pharaoh's palace. And so this is the argument that he's going to put before God. All right, now let me come back to chapter 3 and uh, verse 12. And God says, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people of, out of Israel, of course, out of Egypt, you, that is the nation, shall serve God upon this mountain. And of course, you know that's exactly where they went. They went down to Mount Sinai and camped around the base of it. And as Moses went up into the mountain, then he received the Ten Commandments. It was up in Mount Sinai. He received instructions for building the tabernacle. And it was around Mount Sinai that the tabernacle was finally built and the priesthood was established. And then Israel gets ready to move straight north into the land of milk and honey. But for now, let's come back to verse 13. Now remember, Moses spent 40 years steeped in all the mythologies and all the idols of Egypt. And every idol and every god in Egypt's culture had a name. Whether it was the frog or whether it was the Nile or whether it was the sun or the stars or any other animal or a snake, they had a name for every god. Now Moses hasn't forgotten that. And so, with that background, look at his next question. And he said unto God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? Now, isn't that typical? Because, remember, the children of Israel are in Egypt. They too are surrounded and have been inundated with all the gods of Egypt. And they all had a name. And then here comes this man Moses out of the backside of the desert and he speaks of a god. And what's the first thing they're going to say? All right, Moses, what's his name? And so Moses anticipates. What is his name? What shall I say to them? And now look at the answer. And God said unto Moses, now, I think in every Bible and every translation I've ever seen, it's capitalized. God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, 
I am hath sent me unto you. Now you remember way back when we were in Genesis chapter 4, after we came out of Genesis 1, if you remember, I'm going to try to write this big enough for you way at the back. In Genesis 1, in the beginning, God, isn't it? And so it is all through chapter 1 of Genesis. God said this, and God did that. And then all of a sudden, when you get to chapter, what is it? chapter 4, let's go back and look at it, if you will. Chapter 2, everything in chapter 1 has now been created. It's all been accomplished. Man is on the scene. He's in the garden. And then in chapter 2, verse 4, I think it is, you suddenly see the term, not just God, but Lord God. Isn't that right? Isn't that the way it is in every one of your Bibles? Lord God. Now, is that a misprint? Is that a mistake? No. Because you see, all through the first chapter, we're dealing with God, the Creator. But as soon as we get into chapter 2, man has now come on the scene, and man is going to need a what? You remember those of you with me? Huh? A Savior, but what else? Communicator. That's the word I wanted. Somebody in that Godhead has to be able to communicate with this created being, Adam. Go back in your mind, you all know the verse in John's Gospel, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, and what does it say? In the beginning, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that word, Word, is capitalized, so it was the name of deity. It's the name of God. Now, what do we do with words? We communicate. So in the beginning was the Word the communicator. See? God the communicator. And now as the communicator now has to come on the scene in order to do just that with Adam, we get one person out of that trinity who is the communicator, the Word, and who is it? Jesus in the New Testament, God the Son in the Old Testament. It's Jehovah it's Lord, L-O-R-D, capitalized. So what you really have here in chapter 2, verse 4, is Jehovah God. See? All right, now the term Jehovah then comes out of a couple Hebrew root words, and I suppose I should erase this so we can keep it up where those in the back row can, can see this a little better. Now the term Jehovah then comes from the old Hebrew term for for Yahweh, for God, but it's a connecting word or another word connected to it, Hava. And those two Hebrew words are, Yahweh was the I Am of Exodus chapter 3. Hava, you remember, meant to become more and more and more revealed. That's the very explanation or definition of the word Hava. Now then, you take Yahweh Hava, the I Am, who is to become more and more revealed, and you contract them, and that's where that Jewish young man caught it so quickly, you come up with the name Jehovah. So who is Jehovah? Jehovah is the I Am, but the I Am who would become more and more revealed. Now, as you come on up through human history, so far as the Bible is concerned, isn't that exactly what has happened? All the way up through the Old Testament, God the Son is revealing more and more of Himself. And then finally, He comes in the form of flesh, a further revelation. And then, of course, He goes the way of the cross and He ascends back into heaven, but He's going to come again, and we see that all revealed in the last book of your Bible. And what do we call it? The book of Revelation. And so this is exactly what the Bible has been doing. It's been a continuing, ongoing revelation of God the Son, the Jehovah of the Old Testament. Now I said I was going to show you more clearly just exactly what was entailed with all this. Now turn all the way, if you will, with me to John's Gospel again. John's Gospel. Chapter 8, and 
come all the way up to, oh, verse 49. Because we're going to take the time to read all these verses, so we're sure we, we get the setting. This, of course, is during Christ's earthly ministry as he is being confronted by the Jews and especially the religious leaders of Israel who were constantly accusing him of being a, an imposter. He was supposedly demonic, and they wouldn't give him credit for who he was. And so here again, they are claiming that he has a demon. Drop down to verse 48 of John's Gospel, chapter 8. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a demon? I like the word demon rather than devil. And Jesus answered, I have not a demon, but I honor my Father, and you do dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying... He shall never see death. Now, what did those Jews know concerning life and death? Hey, now he's getting on pretty thin ice. That, that's the territory of God. And now look what they said, verse 52. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil or a demon. Abraham is dead. The prophets, they're dead. And thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, who's dead? Man, yeah, I guess he's dead, has been for 2,000 years. And the prophets, they're all dead. Jeremiah's gone, Isaac's, uh, Isaiah's gone, Daniel's gone, they're all gone. Whom makest thou thyself? Who are you? Well, they should have known who he was. But they didn't. Now read the next verse. Jesus answered. And now I'll tell you what. He's not very kind to them here. And he says, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honoreth me, of whom you say, He's your God. Oh, yeah, they thought they knew the God of Abraham. They thought they knew Jehovah. See? And yet, verse 55, he says, You have not known him, but I know him. Well, I guess he did. And if I should say, I know him not. Now, here's what I was making reference to. Th th this is sharp. If I were to say that I know him not, I should be a liar like you. See? That's pretty strong, isn't it? Now, why could he call them liars? Because they claimed to know him and didn't. And they said that he didn't know him, but he did. And so he said, if I agreed with you that I don't really know God, I'd be as big a liar as you are. Now, read on. Verse 55, yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him and I keep his saying. Now verse 56, your father Abraham, 2,000 years ago, rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Now get the response of those Jews. And then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Can you get the sarcasm in that? Oh, what a blasphemer this is. How can he say things like this? You have seen Abraham? All right, now remember what he told Moses his name was, I am that I am. Now look at the next verse. And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, what? I am. What's he claiming? He's the I am of the burning bush. He's the I am of pre-eternity. He's the I am of all of Scripture. Now, it's interesting to note that throughout the book of John, there are seven distinct I am's that fit so perfectly with seven distinct Jehovah's or I am's in the Old Testament. And those of you who've memorized any scripture at all, what are some of them? I am the bread of life. 
See? I am the way and the truth. I am the resurrection. I am the good shepherd and so on. There's seven of them. He never backed away from being the I am. But now what I want you to see, lest you think I'm putting something in here that isn't here, how did the Jews respond when he claimed to be the I am? Read the next verse or two. And they took up stones to cast at him. Why? They were going to kill him for being such a blasphemer. To claim that he was the Jehovah, the I am of the Old Testament. And they attempted to kill him, but he hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them. And so he passed by. All right, now let's flip back in these closing moments to Exodus once again, chapter 3, verse 15. Moses now has it clearly put that the I am, God the Son, Jehovah, is the one who is doing all of the preparation work. He's the one that's going to be the pillar of fire, the pillar of smoke. And when we get to the tabernacle, now I usually don't spend a lot of time in the tabernacle because it's an area where, except for somebody who is really, really deeply interested in the Word of God, you can get uh, kind of bored real fast. But when we get to the tabernacle, I'm going to at least show very clearly that the word propitiation back there in Romans chapter 3 is lived out in all of its fullness in every jot and tittle of that tabernacle back here in Exodus. Everything that's in that tabernacle is a picture of Christ. For example, the Ark of the Covenant back there in the Holy of Holies, it was a box made of wood which spoke of Christ's earthly side. But it was covered with what? Gold, which spoke of his deity. And all the way through that whole tabernacle, the fence and the, the blocks in which it sat and the, the hides that covered the tent and the sacrifices and the priesthood, the Day of Atonement, everything speaks of the finished work of Christ on the cross, see? But now let, let's come back here to Exodus chapter 3. And so after revealing himself as the I Am, verse 15, God said moreover to Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, and here it comes again, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Now then, they were to bring all the heads of the people together so that he could announce to them that the time of their deliverance is at hand. And then come down to verse 19. Now we want to save some time. And God says, I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. God knows what's going to have to happen. And he says, no, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I'll do in the midst thereof. And after that, after the plagues, he'll let you go. And then verse 22, there's a statement in here that I want to clarify, lest anybody get the wrong. I think it's unfortunate that the translators have done this. But it says in verse 22, every woman shall borrow. Now all the commentaries and all the scholars I've ever read are agreed that the word there should not be borrow, but ask. A-S-K. Because see, the word borrow implies that they would have it and then what? Give it back. God never intended that. And so all he told the women to do, and of course all of Israel, was to ask the Egyptians if they had some, something to give them to send them on their way. And we know from the account that by the time Egypt had gone through the plagues and Egypt was in a shambles, economically, physically, and every other way, the, Jew, uh, the Egyptians literally unloaded all their wealth on the Israelites. Just get out of here. Get going. And God had something else on his mind. It wasn't just to make the Jews or the Israelites rich as they left Egypt. Because as soon as they get down to Sinai, Sinai, he's going to give them instructions to build what? The tabernacle. And that tabernacle is just literally filled with silver and gold and precious stones, fine linen, all the wealth of Egypt. So it was in God's sovereign plan, and it was unfortunate that our translations used the word borrow. They asked, and the Egyptians gave it to them gladly. All right, now then, in the moments we have left, chapter 4, 
Here's where I wanted to come to a moment ago, but I thought we'd wait. Moses answered and he said, but, isn't that just like us? How many times haven't you and I, God probably wants us to do something. He wants us to accomplish something for him. And what do we say? But, but God, you know, I know I have. But God, and Moses was no different. He said, but God, they, behold, they'll not believe me. Hey, I've been gone 40 years. I've been on the backside of the desert. I'm a shepherd. They won't believe me when I tell them I've come. Now, what else did he remember? He went to them when he had all the pomp and circumstance of Egypt, and he thought he could have had everything going for him, and they didn't believe him. Now he says, I come back as an old lowly shepherd. You think they're going to believe me? Now look what God says. Or if Moses has finished the verse. For he says, they will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Now verse 2. And the Lord said unto him, what is that in thy hand? And he said, a rod, a shepherd's staff. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from before it. I mean, that thing was real. And Middle Eastern serpents can be deadly poisonous. So he runs from it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thy hand, and take it by the tail. Now, I don't like to handle snakes, but I've watched others, and the place you grab a live snake is not by the tail, but where? <laughs> right behind the head, where the fangs can't touch you. But see, he tells Moses to do the impossible, you know. Catch it by the tail. And so Moses does, and uh, he put forth his hand and caught it, and immediately it reverted back to his shepherd's rod. Now, what I like to point out here is the beginning of what Paul claims back here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Turn with me, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And this could avert so much confusion and doubt and wonder that is crossing people's minds these days. Verse 22 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now remember this is Paul writing to a Gentile church and it's Paul writing to you and I. And look what he says. For the Jews require, they demand, what? A sign. Now just think about that for a moment. Beginning with Moses going to Pharaoh, or to the children of Israel really first, and then later on to convince Pharaoh that he was representative of the God of Israel, what did he use as proof? Signs. Miracles. And think of it. All through Israel's history, as much Bible as you can possibly remember, didn't it just happen over and over? The supernatural, the miraculous. You take the, the night that the shepherds were on the hills of Judea and that great angelic host appeared singing the choruses of heaven concerning the birth of the Christ. Did that drive those shepherds insane? No. They weren't that shook up. They were almost used to those sort of things. It was part of Israel's history. In well into the book of Acts, Peter is locked up in prison and what comes and it escorts him out of prison? An angel. Now I'll tell you what. If an angel would suddenly go into Big Mac down at McAllister, there'd be a lot of people fainting dead away, wouldn't they? I mean, we're just not programmed for that kind of thing. But Israel was used to it. It was happening all through their history. And it begins right back here when they are now a nation and God is beginning to work with them. And so now come back with me to Exodus. He sends them back to the people under slavery in Egypt and God says, if they don't believe you, throw this rod on the ground and it'll become a serpent. And pick it up and it'll become your rod. Now then, let's read on in just a few minutes. And he said in verse 5, that they may believe, see? That they may believe that the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. And then he goes into the next verse and he gives him yet another sign. And what is it? He puts his hand in, and it becomes leprous. He takes it out, and it's just as perfectly whole as it was before. Now, these were signs given to Moses 
to prove to Israel that he was God's man. And now, here is Les Feldick. And good afternoon. Good to have everybody back with us again. And uh, it just thrills our heart to see so many come together for an afternoon like this. And again, we want to welcome our television audience. And if any of you out there would ever like to come in and be a part of this, of this taping session, it's no secret that we tape four programs on a Wednesday afternoon once a month. And if you can get off work or if you can come in, just call us on our 800 number and we'll give you the date and the time that we'll be taping again. We'd love to have you. All right, now for those of you here in the studio audience, as well as those of you watching television, we trust you'll take your Bible and turn with me now to Exodus chapter 4. We're going to continue right on where we left off with our last program. And you remember that Moses now has been commissioned by God to go and confront Pharaoh for the distinct purpose of bringing Israel out of bondage. But he's going to have some difficulty. And the first difficulty, of course, is overcoming his, his own timidity. And if you'll t go down with me to Exodus chapter 4, and let's just start with verse 10 where we left off, and you'll find that Moses is still claiming he can't do it. Now, remember I gave you the reason last time. He's been 40 years on the backside of the desert herding sheep. He's had almost no contact with public or with populated areas, and he has consequently gotten to the place where he is insecure. He does not feel that he can approach Pharaoh, and after 40 years, I think we can all identify with that. He had lost his polish, which he, of course, had when he went out to deliver the children of Israel the first time, and they rejected him. He had been 40 years in Pharaoh's palace. No doubt he had all the wisdom of Egypt at his disposal. He had, like I've already said, he had the polish. He had the charisma. He had the power, but Israel rejected him. But, of course, God wasn't in that. And uh, God couldn't use him that way because God can't use somebody who is self-prepared or has been prepared by the world. Now, if you'll follow with me then in Exodus 4, as Moses continues to debate the issue with the Lord, he says, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. Now, I, I think it's interesting to notice that God has already used the signs to convince Moses that he indeed was going to be led of God by virtue of, you remember, throwing the rod down and it became a serpent, picked it up and again became a rod. And then you remember the next one he used was to place his hand in his bosom and it became leprous, took it out and put it back and it was whole. Well, these were all signs, of course, to prove to Moses that God indeed meant what he said. So now, as we go to the New Testament and, and look at some of the references that have a direct connection with this, I'd like to look at the, at the fact that the Jews, beginning right here with Moses, all the way up through their history, have had to have signs in order to be convinced of what God was saying and what he was doing. Now, I'm kind of betwixt and between. I think before we look at the sign aspect, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 for just a second and see why God had to put this man Moses back on the backside of the desert for 40 years in order to prepare him from God's point of view in order to be an instrument that God could use. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where... Paul, again, is laying out the, the wisdom that can come only from God and not from men. Now, come down to verse 26, where the apostle writes, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the what? Oh, he's chosen the foolish things of the world, that is, from the world's viewpoint. 
He has chosen the foolish things to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Now put that right back in perspective with Moses. Isn't that exactly what God did with a man? Oh, when he was mighty, when he had power, when he had clout, God couldn't use him. He went out there in the energy of the flesh and thought he could deliver the children of Israel. So God, by, I think, a sovereign act, gets Moses where he can prepare him to be the kind of a man he can use. And of all places, that's the last place you and I would have sent him, he goes out to become a sheep herder for 40 years out in the wilderness where he has almost no contact with, like I said, the public or people of stature. And so Moses now is what in his own eyes? He's nothing. He's a nobody. But in God's eyes, he's now what? He's everything. And you see that that's the requirement for service even today. That's why Paul refers to it here in Corinthians. If you want to be a Sunday school teacher, if you want to be a missionary, if you want to be anything in God's service, the first place we have to come to is to understand that in ourselves, we are nothing. You can bring nothing of this world's education. You can bring nothing of this world's talents. You can bring nothing of what you may have inherited. God can't use any of that. But we all have to come to the place where Moses was and as even Paul was brought. Educated as he was at the feet of Gamaliel, yet Paul had to understand that when it came to be a servant of God's grace, especially to the Gentiles, he had to begin as a nobody. And this is what he says all the way through his writing. Look at chapter 2. You're in Corinthians 1, just across the page in chapter 2 where he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech. He didn't come as a smooth orator. He was not an Apollos. And he says, I didn't come with wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear. You know, a lot of times we look at Paul and all of his journeys and all of his preachings, and we think the guy had, well, excuse the expression, but we like to think he had a lot of guts, don't we? But oh, he didn't. He didn't. He was very commonplace. He shook in his boots as he would enter some of these strange places just as you and I would. And then verse 4, he says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words. See, that's what a lot of people think it takes in order to get people to... No, it doesn't. You don't have to have 10 degrees behind your name in order to be something for God. Thank goodness that's true or I wouldn't be here. But anyway, we have to realize that God uses the things that the world looks and scoffs at and says, hey, who does he, who does she think they are anyway? Hey, that's the person God can use. You know, I'm always reminded years ago, I uh, had a young man who had been attending one of our great Bible schools in preparation for the ministry. And one of the young gentlemen in his class just seemed to have everything. He had personality, he had the looks, he had the voice, he had the intelligence. And so his fellow classmates, before they graduated, had voted that this young man was most likely to succeed in the ministry. And they all thought he really would, because he had everything going for him. He got a little church, and within six months he was out of the ministry. He couldn't cut it. Why? Because, see, he was relying on the things of the flesh and not on the real call of God. So whatever the case may be, if you intend or want to be a, a Sunday school teacher or any kind of God's service, always remember, the only thing God can start with is nothing. All right, now then I said we would also look in the New Testament with regard to the beginning of the signs as Moses experienced them even before he goes to Pharaoh. And then, of course, we're going to see in chapter 5, I think it is, where he puts those signs to use in front of the old pagan king of, of Egypt. So the sign gifts, as we see them begin, I'd like to have you turn with me now to Matthew, if you would. Gospel of Matthew, and I think it was chapter 12. No, it's chapter 11. I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 11. Now, most of us who know anything about our Bible at all realize that when Jesus began his earthly ministry, 
how did he, in our own vernacular, how did he kick it off? How did his earthly ministry begin? Oh, with miracles. All right, now you know that all through that th three years of his earthly sojourn there in the land of Israel, he performed miracle after miracle after miracle, didn't he? Now why? Well, here's the reason. Come down to Matthew chapter 11, verse 2. Now when John, that is John the Baptist, had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, that is, through the disciples, he said to Jesus, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Now can you imagine a man like John the Baptist having fulfilled the ministry that he had, comes to the place where he questions what he does. And again, it just shows that even John, even though his birth was miraculous, he too, you know, came from parents that were really past age, much like Isaac did. But nevertheless, where is John? Well, he's in prison. And what does John know about this Jesus out there? He's got the power to just simply take him right out of the hands of the authorities and set him free. But he's not doing it. And so from the human standpoint, what he's full John is beginning to wonder. Well, is he who he says he is? Is he who I said he is? And so he sends two of his friends to seek Jesus out somewhere up and down the land of Israel. And so they came and uh, they found Jesus. And they said, hey... Our friend John wants to know, are you the Christ, or are we still looking for another one? Now look at the answer. Verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show or tell John again. Oh, reinforce. Reinforce his knowledge. Go and tell John again those things which you do hear and see. And what did they hear and see? The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor are having the gospel preached to them. And whenever I read this, especially in a class, I always followed up with a question. So why, basically, did Jesus perform all these miracles to the nation of Israel? To prove who he was. The Jews, 1 Corinthians 1 says, require a sign. They did all the way up through the Old Testament. Jesus comes on the scene, and we're going to see it, if not in this half hour, in one of the next ones, how that again they came to him at one point in his ministry, and they said, show us a sign. See, show us a sign. They were always looking for signs. It was just their very nature, and that's why Paul has it by inspiration then in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that the Jews desire a sign. Now then, let me give you another instance. In Acts chapter 10, in Acts chapter 10, now here, of course, we have the account of Cornelius up there at Caesarea being prompted by God to send for Peter, who is down the coast 80, 90 miles in the city of Joppa. And Peter, by the urging and the miraculous working again of God, finally gets to the house of Cornelius. But you see, Peter was still a good law-keeping Jew, and he had a lot of trepidation about going up to a Jewish household. And so I imagine for this reason, he took several of his fellow Jewish believers with him from Joppa to Caesarea. Now, the Scripture doesn't, I don't believe, tell us exactly how many, but it just says some of them, brethren, that came with him. And so, if you wonder about Peter's trepidation, as I called it, come all the way into chapter 10 and verse 28. And now remember, this is about 10 years after Pentecost, 10 years after the, the uh, crucifixion. And uh, if any of you think that the law had long since been set aside and that as soon as you get into Matthew, you're in the Christian economy, you better think again. Because look at what Peter says when he gets to the house of Cornelius. In fact, I guess I should even show you the other one with that regard. That'd be in chapter, uh, chapter 10, verse 14. Where Peter sees this vision. And in the vision, the Lord says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Well, what was in that sheet? Well, a lot of unclean animals, according to the Jewish diet. 
Now, if you think Peter has been set free from the law, then you haven't read your Bible. Look what the next portion says. Verse 14. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Common or unclean according to what? The Jewish law. Ten years after Pentecost, and Peter is still sticking to the law. He's not going to eat pork. He's not going to eat something that was not in the list of clean animals. All right, now, if you think I'm making too much of a point of that, now come across to verse 28. And he said unto them, that is Peter, as he approaches the door of Cornelius' home, and he said to them, the house of Cornelius, you know how that it is an, what's the next word? Unlawful. See? It's an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto a place of another nation, a Gentile. But, see, but God hath showed me that I should call any man common or unclean. But you see, he was never convinced before this. Now then, he begins his preaching to the house of Cornelius, and he's moving right along with his message. Now pick it up, if you will, in verse 44. Acts 10, verse 44, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them who heard the word. Now remember, all these that are in the house of Cornelius are Gentiles, with the exception of a few Jews that came with Peter up from Joppa. And I imagine that was moral support. Now verse 45, And they of the circumcision who, what? Believe. Believed. See, these weren't unbelieving Jews that Jesus had to put up with all the time. These were Jews who, along with Peter, had recognized who Jesus was. And so these men who came from Joppa up to Caesarea in uh, fellowship with Peter were, what's the next word? Astonished. Astonished. Ten years after Pentecost, and they're astonished that Gentiles could be saved? Yeah, they were. Now, most people never see that word. Why were they astonished? It had never happened before. They'd never seen Gentiles come to a knowledge of salvation. Oh, there were some proselytes, I know that. But I think most proselytes never really had salvation. They had religion, but they didn't have salvation. Witness the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. Oh, he was religious. He'd been to Jerusalem to worship at one of the feast days. But on his way back to Ethiopia, what does Philip do? Leads him to the place of salvation. He hadn't been saved. He was a proselyte, but he didn't have salvation. All right. Now, these Jews were believers. They had come with Peter from Joppa, and they were astonished because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit. How did these Jews know? Next verse. For they, the Jewish believers, heard them, the believers now in the house of Cornelius, Gentiles, heard these Gentiles speak with tongues and magnify God. Now, what did that do to those Jews? It proved that God was doing something that they didn't think was possible, and that was what? Save a Gentile without becoming a proselyte of Israel. So here again, the sign was particularly used to convince these Jews, because where are the Jews going to go from Cornelius' house? Right back to Jerusalem. And what should they have done? Why, they should have just spread the word that God is now ready to turn to the Gentiles without Israel. But did they? No. You go back to Acts chapter 15 and you'll find out that Peter and these who evidently went with him had never said a word for another eight or ten years. Not one word did they cast along the children of Israel that God was now dealing with the Gentiles on his own ground and not on the basis of using the nation of Israel. So you see all the way through. Now I guess you can go back to 1 Corinthians. I want you to see the verse with your own eyes so that you don't take my word for anything. Now if you'll move again to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And again, we have to, for sake of content, start with verse 18. 
I think most of you have been in my class, my teaching, long enough to know I just detest using one verse if I can help it because you've got to use the whole context if at all possible. All right, now beginning with verse 18 then, Paul states, again by inspiration, for the preaching of the cross. Now at some point in the next two or three programs, we're going to come back again to the New Testament and show that so much of what we're hearing today is leaving out the cross, and we can't do that. Nobody can be saved by just simply believing in Jesus. It has to be the work of the cross. And so Paul states that here. It's the preaching of the cross. It's to them that perish, to the unbelieving world. It's what? Foolishness. It doesn't amount to anything. But, now you remember I'm always telling you to look for that little three-lettered word. It makes all the difference in the world. The world may think the preaching of the cross is foolishness, but to us who are saved, it, the preaching of the cross, is what? The power of God. Now, we're going to see that again when we get back to Exodus, so I'm, I'm getting you ready for some great things, I think, that are coming. It takes the power of God to save us, to set us free from the shackles of sin. And that power can never be released, released from God until we believe the gospel that Christ died, shed his blood, was buried, and rose again. You know, I'm, I may say it again before these next four programs are over. And I, I always tell people, in because I'm getting senile, I, I repeat a lot of these things purposely for emphasis. The scripture does. I suppose my kids would probably be prone to say, Dad, you're getting old. Now you're starting to repeat yourself. But uh, no, sometimes we have to. But anyway, what we have to understand is that today, even amongst evangelical Christians, there is too much use of what I call cliches. Now, you know what a cliche is. It's just a little coin statement that we've learned to use at the proper places. And I think too much of Christianity is using cliches, which... If the person fully understands the whole gospel picture, that cliché may say it all. But too many don't. Now you say, what are you talking about? You've all heard the expression, I've used it, and I imagine you've used it. Well, I've accepted the Lord Jesus as my personal Savior. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But what is it? It's a coin. It's not in the book. You show me one verse where it says, if you will take Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, thou shalt be saved. It doesn't say that. But you see, we've coined it. Now, if you take the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior based on the fact that he, the very Son of God, became flesh, went to the cross, shed his blood, was buried, and rose from the dead, and you put that whole body of truth into your cliché, then I've got no problems. But how many people can do that? Another one we like to use, well, if you just believe in Jesus, well, what Jesus are you believing in? Are you believing in the Jesus of the three years that he ministered to Israel? Or are you putting your faith in that Jesus who went to the cross and rose from the dead? See what I'm saying? How many times haven't you heard the expression, well, if you'll just take Jesus into your heart, Again, there's nothing basically wrong with that except that unless the person who is doing that, taking him into his heart, understands that the only reason you can have Christ in your heart is because of what he did on that cross, hey, I'm afraid it's all for nothing. And, and this is what worries me. It scares me that people are being led into a false security by simply taking cliches without knowing the full truth of the matter. All right, now that's so much for that. I'll probably come back to it again. So we're saved by the power of God from the preaching of the cross. Verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Isn't that so true? Oh, the Jewish scholars, they studied the Torah. They still do, but they don't know God. I wish I'd have brought along the clipping out of the last Jerusalem Post. I read it to my class last night, and I just shared with a few here this afternoon of what was in it, and I'll tell you what, 
to be written by one of the chief rabbis in the land of Israel, you can't believe what you're reading. In so many words, he says, concerning the coming of the Messiah, and all of Israel now is aware that we're about at the time for the coming of their Messiah. And he says in plain English <clears throat> that after all, the Messiah that Israel is looking for will be a man. He will come in with political clout. He will have military power behind him. And he's going to be able to set Israel up, destroy her enemies, and then from that power base bring peace to the whole world. Now, those of you with me who know your Bible, what man are they looking for? The Antichrist. A perfect description of him, see? And he wasn't thinking in terms of the Antichrist. He was thinking in terms of Israel's Messiah, see? But anyway, that's the wisdom of this world. But oh, Paul wants us to have the wisdom of God. And how do we get it? By the foolishness of preaching, see? Through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe and what else? nothing. See, here we have it again. Faith plus nothing. Now, here's the verse I was headed for. Verse 22. It took me a long time to get there. I'm sorry. For the Jews require what? A sign. Now, we're going to see that. We're going to have time again in this half hour. It's already gone. But we're going to see when we go back to Exodus. Just as soon as Moses approaches the children of Israel, he does what God told him to do. He throws down the rod, and it becomes a serpent. He performs another miracle, and then it says in the next verse, we'll see it in the next half hour, and they believed. Why? Because they saw the signs. And it's been all the way up through Israel's history, and like I've already said, this is what I want. If nothing else is remembered from this half hour, the reason Jesus spent three years performing signs and miracles up and down the land of Israel was to prove to those Jews who he really was. Thank you for watching through now. Here is Les Feldick. And again, it's good to have everybody back with us. And for those of you on the television audience, we just trust you'll get your Bible again and sit down and be part of this class with us. We'd like to always remind you we appreciate your correspondence and uh, we just can't express our thanks in words because they certainly are an encouragement to us. Now again, we ask that you will turn with us to Exodus just for a little bit in chapter 4 once again. We'll come down to verse 29 where we now know that Moses and Aaron have been joined together because when Moses cried about the fact that he didn't have a tongue and he couldn't speak, God in his anger said, well, I'll let Aaron be your mouthpiece. And so consequently, this is what brought the two gentlemen together. Remember, they're brothers. And Aaron now becomes the spokesman, but Moses is the one through whom God does the speaking and gives the direction. So now then, Moses and Aaron, they approach the children of Israel there in Goshen. And if you'll come all the way down to verse 29, where Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel, and Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses. Now do you see the, the, the order? And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses, and did the, what's the next word? Signs in the sight of the people, that is, the children of Israel, and the people, what? Believe. Believe. Why? Because they saw the signs. See how, how simple that is? And they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction. They bowed their heads and worshipped. All right, now we go on into chapter 5. And afterward, after they've approached the children of Israel, have given them the signs, and now have got them supposedly convinced that God is about to do something, Moses and Aaron went in to Pharaoh, and they said, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? Or we would have to say Jehovah, because the word Lord is, is always indicative of the term Jehovah. Now, as I pointed out in our programs a few weeks ago, everything in Egypt was a god. 
The frogs were gods, the moon was a god, the sun was a god, and every animal you could think of was a god, and they all had a name. So when Moses and Aaron came and say the God of Israel, Jehovah, is going to lead the children out, Pharaoh's natural response was, well, who's Jehovah? He's just another one of your gods, but he doesn't mean anything to me. And so he says, who is Jehovah that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? Well, he's not going to learn, but it's going to take a while. And he says, I know not Jehovah, neither will I let Israel go. Now, I think we've got to stop here a moment. In everything, there's a reason. I mean, these people were just as human as we are. Their governments functioned even as governments do for the most part today. Now, how many people realize that when Pharaoh was confronted with losing the Israelis, what was he really going to lose? The backbone of his economy. They were the workers. They were the ones that were getting all the daily work done. And the Egyptians had just become an upper-class elite who did nothing but make sure that those Jews got the work done. And I always like to compare this even to America, especially the South, before the Civil War. Why were our plantation owners so uptight about losing slavery? It was the backbone of their economy. How would an American farmer do today if the government would just simply say we're going to take all of your farm equipment away from you? We aren't going to let you use tractors or combines anymore. What would they do? Oh, they'd go bananas because after all, how could they get their crops in the ground and get them out if they don't have their machinery? Well, this is what was confronting Egypt. You take those Jews away from me, Pharaoh says, and I've got nothing. And it was economics as much as anything. And so he says, I'll not let them go. And of course, God has got more involved in the big picture. But I'm just saying that from the human element, they were faced with something that they couldn't cope with. How are they going to get their work done? All right. He says, I will not let Israel go. Now, verse 3. And they, that is Moses and Aaron, said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us go, we pray thee. Now underline the next two words. Let us go three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with sword. Now why the three days' journey? Well, you see, three is a significant number again in Scripture, isn't it? We've got the triune God. That's where everything begins. The Trinity. And everything in creation rests upon trinities of sorts. You take creation itself, rests upon a basic trinity of time, space, and matter. You take any one of those three away and you haven't got a universe. Because that's what the whole function is. It's matter, whether it's the planet or whether it's the moons or whether it's you and I as people. We are matter moving through space in a given period of time. And that's what makes the whole universe function. I always like to even use water as a good example. What is water? It's a liquid. It's a solid. It's a gas. And so it is in all of creation. You've got so many of these things that rest upon a trinity of sort. Now, I don't like to use the word trinity for water because normally we think of the Godhead, so forgive me for that. But everything rests upon a three. Now, way back here, what do you suppose God has on his mind when he tells Moses and Aaron that he wants Israel to go three days' journey out of Egypt? All right, there's only one thing that can separate a person from slavery. And remember, this whole book of, e of uh, Exodus is a picture of redemption, first of Israel being redeemed out of Egypt, but it's the perfect picture of you and I being redeemed out of the shackles of sin and brought to a life of freedom. All right, so the three days are indicative, I'm quite sure, of the resurrection. Now, if you'll turn with me to the New Testament, go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. And come down to verse 38. 
Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. I'd like to give you time to find it so that you can read all these things with your own eyes. Matthew 12, verse 38. Now, of course, this is during Christ's earthly ministry. And then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a... What's that word again? We would see a sign from thee. But he answered unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was, here it comes, three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So way back here in Exodus, God is already giving us now then a picture of some basic premises and that there is no setting us free from the shackles of sin any more than there was any reason for expecting Israel to be set free of Egypt unless they could have three days separating them from their place of captivity. And it's the same way in our salvation. If we try to ignore the basic premise of the gospel again, and that is that Christ died, was in the grave three days and three nights, and rose from the dead, we have no gospel. But when we put our faith in that gospel, that three days and three nights in the tomb separates us from that old life of sin and bondage. And this is what we want to keep so clear in our thinking, that Israel had to be separated, but it took the three days journey to do it, even as it took the three days of Christ's time in the tomb to separate us. Now I'd like to, if you will, come on over to, uh, I think I wanted to go back to Corinthians once again, and uh, maybe I want to go back to Exodus. Maybe let's go back to Exodus for just a moment. Yeah, let's go back to Exodus for just a second, and then we're going to flip back once more into the New Testament. Back to chapter 5, verse 3. Repeating now, And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with a sword. And now verse 4, And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore... Do you, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you to your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and you make them rest from their burdens. Now, what Pharaoh is going to make sure, as much as he can, is that he does not lose these captives. Now, when we come into the spiritual realm, who also is going to do everything he can to keep from losing his captives? Satan. All right, now I want you to keep that uppermost in your mind. Satan will do anything to keep from losing one of his captives. You know, whenever I, I read this, and while I describe this a moment, I guess we can go to, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where I was going to go a moment ago, but I wanted to come back here first. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. A year or two ago, I was getting a piece of equipment ready to go to the field, and uh, as we see here in Oklahoma, a big, beautiful spider web. And that big old spider was just sitting up there in the corner waiting for his victim. And while I was working on it, I think it was on a brush hog, a big old locust flew into that big spider web. Now, I would have thought he'd go right through it, but he didn't. He hit that spider web and it just came back. And as fast as a stroke of lightning, that spider came down, and as a rule, I always thought they stung him and killed their prey, but he didn't even bother with that. He just wrapped that thing up in webbing. And I mean, it was so fast, it was mind-boggling, but that old spider had that big old locust completely wrapped with web. And when he had him completely immobilized, he went right back up to his corner waiting for the next one. But you know, I don't like to even see a locust die, so I took out my pocket knife and I cut that web off that old locust. He dropped to the ground, and he laid there for a minute. I guess he didn't know what hit him, and then he took off. Now, I have to think that had to be the happiest locust that ever lived. <laughs> but you see, 
you know what I had in my mind even as I watched all that? Isn't that exactly where you and I were? You see, every person born into the human race is dead spiritually. And as we move on up through those little innocent years, Satan begins to wrap his web. And by the time we reach the age of accountability, eight, nine, ten, whatever you want to call it, he has got us completely wrapped in his web as that old spider did with that locust. Now listen, there was no way that spider would have ever gotten out of that web. There wasn't a thing he could do. He was immobilized, he was helpless. But an outside power, my pocket knife, set him free. Now it's the same way in the spiritual realm. The lost person, even though he doesn't realize it, is totally bound up in Satan's web. And nobody can cut that web but the power of God himself. And this is what we have to see. Now, you got 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And let's just start with verse 14 because it, it just does injustice not to use all of these verses. Where again, Paul is writing to the Gentiles at Corinth, and he says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, or drives us on, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were how many? All. See? Not just the worst, but all. Not just the Gentiles, but all. Not just the Jews, all. Every human being is dead spiritually. Now verse 15, and that he died for all, that they who live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. Now, what do you see in that last statement? Well, that's the gospel. See? See how Paul always brings it? Now, he may not say the whole thing, but he'll either say that you have to believe in the one who rose from the dead, which indicates his death, or he may speak of his burial and his resurrection, but he's always showing us the complete picture of death, burial, and resurrection as our gospel. Now then, verse 16, Wherefore, since Christ has accomplished everything that needs to be accomplished, wherefore, henceforth, henceforth from when? From when he gave us that gospel when the death, burial, and resurrection was completed. All right? Henceforth, we know no man, not even Jesus, after the flesh. Now you say, well, how do you know he's talking about Jesus? Read on. Yea, though Paul says we, and I'm sure he's speaking of himself, though he says we have known Christ after the flesh. Now, as near as chronologers that I study can tell, Paul was about the same age as Christ. So when Jesus began his earthly ministry at the age of 30, Saul of Tarsus was about the same age. And he was a young up-and-comer in the religion of the Jew, in Judaism. And so even though I'm quite sure that Saul and Jesus never crossed paths, yet Saul knew who Jesus was. He knew what he was doing, and he knew where he'd come from, and he knew all about him, but of course he didn't know him. And so Paul can rightly say, yes, we knew Christ in the flesh. Yet now, henceforth, from this point on, we know him no more. Now you know what he's saying? He is flying in the face of what too much of us hear too much of today. And what is it? They preach Jesus in his earthly ministry. And that's all well and good as far as it goes. But, beloved, there is no salvation in simply understanding his earthly ministry. We have to go to where? The cross. We have to go to the resurrection. Otherwise, as Paul says here, we know him for nothing. And we have to go beyond that. Now then, as we know him as the Christ after the resurrection, now verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new what? Creature. creature or creation. Now, what has happened? We've had that web cut off. We have been set free. And we are no longer under the shackles of Satan. We are now, as Israel was, brought out of Egypt, set apart 
for God. Now, of course, we're going to see in coming chapters in Exodus, when things got a little rough, where did the Jew always hanker to go back to? Oh, the old life in Egypt. And you see, isn't that the problem with so many believers? Oh, as soon as things get a little tough, well, then the tempter comes and says, See, you are probably better off back where you were before, but don't you believe it. Don't you believe it. That, that's, the, that's the working of, of Satan, who is always appealing, you see, to the flesh. But now I don't want to stop here, since we're in this chapter. We want to go on to verse 18. All things are of God, who hath... Now, what's that next word? Reconcile. Now, when we started the study on Exodus, I said Exodus is a book of redemption. You remember that? It's a picture of being bought back. But see, reconciliation is, is a next of kin to redemption. Because when two people are estranged and they can get their act together and come back together, what do we call it? Reconciliation. It's the same thing practically as being redeemed and brought back with a price. Now then, Paul uses this word here in regard to you and I, that God has reconciled us to himself by, again, Jesus the Christ. And you know that Paul is in reference to his work of the cross. But he didn't stop there. When he reconciled us, when he gave us salvation, what else did he give us? A ministry. What kind of a ministry? Reconciliation. In other words, you know what God expects every one of us to do as he gives opportunity? Now, I have never been one that to advocate that we go and just simply uh, knock on doors or uh, grab people by the shirt collar and say, hey, listen to me. I, I just don't believe the Lord wants to work that way. But as he gives opportunity, and he will, now what do we got to be ready for? Oh, we got to be ready to jump on it. And now look what Paul says. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, when we get the opportunity, we have to tell that person wrapped in Satan's web that, listen, God has done everything that needed to be done to set you free, to reconcile you to himself. And so he's given us the message, the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, and here it is. To wit, that is to say that God, the whole triune God, with all of his power, was where? In Christ. See? In Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, why has God left us here? To be what? Ambassadors. Ambassadors. Now, what's an ambassador? If you know anything about government, if you know anything about current events, an ambassador is a representative of a government, not in his own homeland, but in a strange land. See? You remember many years ago, I think about 20 years ago now, there was a best-selling book called The Ugly American. Some of you older ones remember it. And it was an expose of the horrible lifestyle of our foreign service people who were giving foreigners the totally wrong picture of what America really was. They were being drunkards, they were immoral, and they were just simply not representing so-called Christian America. And consequently, the title was The Ugly Americans. But nevertheless, we all understand that ambassadors are to represent the home government in a foreign environment. Now, let's read on. You and I, then, have been left as ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he, God, hath made him Christ to be sin for us, he who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All right, now getting back to the ambassador part of it. As soon as we become a child of God by faith in the gospel, we become citizens of what? Heaven. Paul teaches clearly that every believer is already, even though we're left here on the earth, our citizenship is in heaven. See, this is what got the early Christians in trouble with the Roman government. When they would give their allegiance to nobody but their God. Their citizenship was in heaven. 
and their Roman citizenship was now secondary. So we always have to remember that we're left here as ambassadors of heaven, where our home really is, where our citizenship is, and we are to represent that citizenship as we walk on this earth. Now, as Israel, now come back with me, I think, to, uh, I think I want 2 Corinthians chapter 6. No, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now this also was involved in bringing Israel out of Egypt. Because as soon as God brings the nation of Israel out of, out of Egypt, they are to be a separated people. And we'll see that in the next half hour. The instructions were clear cut. They were to have nothing to do with the people around them. They were to be a separated, holy nation of people. Again, the lesson comes right in for you and I today. You see, this is what's happened to Christianity. Christianity has gotten to the place there's no difference. Most people can't tell the difference from a Christian from an unbeliever by looking at his behavior, his lifestyle, and everything. But see, that's not what God intended. We're to be different. Now, not oddballs. Now, I, I don't ascribe to the fact that just because we're Christians that we got to be complete oddballs and we got to walk with a long face. Hey, if anybody's got reason to be joyful in this perplexing world, I think it's you and I as believers. But come back here to verse or 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And, uh, oh, let's see, I suppose I should go back even to chapter 3. But let's stay here in chapter 6, where Paul, again, is writing to the Corinthians. And he says, verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, and so forth. Now verse 11, and such, what's the verb? Were, see, past tense, not anymore. But such were some of you. But you are, what's the next word? Washed. Oh, not in water, but oh, by an act of the sovereign holy God, we're washed. You're sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of of our God. Now that reminds me another verse. Come back to John's Gospel again, if you will. John's Gospel. This one just came to mind, so you have to give me a second. I think it's in chapter, chapter 13, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. In John's Gospel, chapter 13. Oh, our time is gone. Quickly. John's Gospel, chapter 13. And here we have Jesus washing the feet of the apostles. Now, the reason I just came across this thought was because Paul says we're washed. And, of course, when you think of washing, you think of water. But uh, in the spiritual realm, we are not cleansed by water. We're cleansed by an act of God. Now, you got John's Gospel, chapter 13. Jesus is coming down the line washing the feet of the apostles. And now in verse 7, he comes to Peter. Or six, and then cometh Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And Peter said, Thou shalt never wash my feet. You can see Peter, can't you? You can just about hear him. And Jesus answered, If I wash thee not, that is his feet, thou hast no part with me. Now, Peter was notorious, you know, for putting his foot in his mouth, and boy, he really does it in the next verse. And now what does he say? Simon Peter said, Lord, then not my feet only, but what? Wash me all over. Give me a bath. Hands and feet, the whole bit. And then in verse 10, Jesus said, He that is, what's the word? Washed. He's been cleansed, not by water, but by the blood of the Lamb. He that has been washed needeth not anything more except to wash his feet. And, of course, what's the lesson? Though they were cleansed at the central bath, but as they would walk home through those dusty streets, their feet would become dirty, and consequently, they needed washing.
Thank you. And now, here is Les Feldick. And again, good afternoon or good evening, whatever the case may be. And I want to welcome our television audience. And if you've never tuned in to us before, or as we hear so often that people go through their remote and they accidentally catch our program. Well, I don't think anything happens accidentally, so we trust that God has a reason for it and that you will become a part of our listening audience. So we just like to have you take a Bible and study along with us, look up the references and see what the book really says. All right, for those of you here in the studio, if you've turned to Exodus chapter 5, and uh, we'll just pick right up where we left off, for Moses and Aaron have now confronted Pharaoh have made their demand that Israel is to leave Egypt for at least a three days journey into the wilderness so that they could sacrifice to the Lord their God. And of course, Pharaoh rebelled at even the thought of that. And he begins to put on harder tasks upon the slaves of Israel. And the one I like to point out in particular is verse 7, where Pharaoh says, you shall no more give the people straw to make brick. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard the term higher criticism, but higher criticism was that group of theologians beginning in about the late 1800s, especially in Germany, who began to just scoff at certain parts of Scripture that they thought were unbelievable. And this was one of them. The higher critics just scoffed at the idea of using straw to make bricks. Who'd ever heard of such a thing? But you know, as I've said so often in this class, bless the archaeologists, most of them are agnostics and they are atheists or whatever, but at least when they find something that is in line with Scripture, they do report it. And then I think it was probably as far back as maybe the 20s or the 30s, the archaeologists coming out of Europe, working there in the Middle East, found that indeed the ancients did make brick with straw. It was part of the binding part. And so again, the critics were silenced. The word of God is very, very true. And so indeed, they had to go out and now instead of having others bring the uh, elements of their concrete and their mortar and their bricks to them, they had to go out and gather it all themselves and yet maintain what today we would call their quota of production. And so they begin to cry. Verse 8. Therefore they cried, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Verse 9. Let there be no more work laid upon the men that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. And the taskmasters of the people, that is, of Egypt, went out, and their officers, and they spake to the people, saying, Thus saith Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go get it yourselves. Verse 11, Go ye and get your straw where you can find it, yet not aught of your work shall be diminished. Your quota maintains the same. And so anyway, things keep getting worse, and uh, finally, the children of Israel are beginning to wonder whether Moses and Pharaoh really know what it's all about. And they come unto them, and uh, oh, where is it? Verse 22, and Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this thy people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people, neither hast thou delivered the people at all. Now, isn't that common reaction from the human? Here, God has said, I'm going to deliver them. I'm going to take them out. Moses and Aaron confront Pharaoh. Pharaoh, in turn, lays more burden upon the Jews and makes life even more miserable. And now they're beginning to wonder, is God going to do what he said he did? Are Moses and Aaron for real? All right, now let's go down into chapter 6. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. Oh, God's setting him up. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And now verse 3. <clears throat> I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, unto Jacob, by the name God 
Almighty. Now, in the Hebrew, that's El Shaddai. And it's unfortunate, really, that it was translated simply Almighty because the word Shaddai implies so much more than that. It implies the sustainer. It supplies or it implies the providing, the provisions, and the, well, I always like to include in there the security blanket. I guess we all know what that is. God was literally the, the security of his people. And that was all involved in that Hebrew word of deity, El Shaddai. And so this is what God says. They've always known me as El Shaddai, the Almighty God, as we've had it translated in the King James, or the All-Providing One. But he says, by the name of uh, Jehovah, I was not known unto them. Now, you remember the name in Jehovah implied the I Am. Remember back in Exodus chapter 3 when we studied a few weeks ago when Moses asked the voice in the burning bush, when I go back to Egypt and they'll say, what's his name? What shall I tell them? What was the answer? You tell them, I am hath sent you. I am that I am is sending you into Egypt. And then you remember we showed you how that Jesus also referred to himself as the I am. In fact, I don't know whether we should take time to look at them now or not. I don't think so. But there are seven distinct names of Jehovah that are intrinsic with God's dealing with the nation of Israel. In fact, the name Jehovah is primarily the name of God as he deals with his covenant people. Now, the others, I don't know if I can remember all of them. There are seven of them. But you remember when Abraham found the ram in the thicket? when he was supposed to have sacrificed Isaac, and he called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, which meant God is the provider. And then you go to another one. I don't know if I got them in order now, but you go to Psalms 23, the Psalms that you all know. What's the first verse? The Lord is my shepherd, but in the Hebrew is Jehovah Reha, which means Jehovah the shepherd. And on and on we go. Uh, another one is Jehovah Rapha, where he brought Israel out of Egypt. And with all of their pagan practices, they were already plagued with diseases. But he told Israel that if they would be true to his commandments, he would keep them from the diseases of Egypt. And as a result of that, he was called Jehovah Rapha, the healer or the protector from disease. Another one is Jehovah Nissi. And that goes back to when they had their first war coming out of Egypt. And they ran up against who? The Amalekites. You remember? And do you remember that when Moses would hold his hands up, the battle would go for Israel? And he'd get tired and they'd fall down and Israel would start getting whooped. But what did happen? Well, her and, who was it, Caleb? Huh? Held his arms up and they won the battle. Well, then as a result of that, the name of Jehovah was coined Jehovah Nissi, our banner. It was Jehovah who won the battle. And then there's so a couple more. I think the last one that I can remember is Jehovah Sid Canoe, which is translated Jehovah our righteousness. Now, these are all names of deity that were intrinsic with God's dealing with Israel. And then the last one, which is mentioned, I think, in the book of Ezekiel, is Jehovah Shammah, H-H-M-M-A-H, which means I am there. Now, that, of course, goes clear into the future to when Christ will indeed be ruling on the kingdom on earth and he will be in their presence. So all these names of Jehovah are wrapped up in that one name, Jehovah. He is everything to the nation of Israel. All right, now then come down to verse 4 of Exodus 6, where he says, I have also established my, what's the next word? Covenant. covenant. Now, those of you who have been with me over the whole period of time from Genesis 1, you begin to realize why I spent so much time on that Abrahamic covenant, because all of Scripture is going to rest on that covenant that God made with Abraham. And he again comes back to it here. 
I have established my covenant to give them, that is, the children of the covenant, the children of Abraham, the nation of Israel, to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my, what? Covenant, see? And God will never forget it. Now, there are a lot of people tonight that think that God is all through with the Jew. God's forgotten all about his covenants that he made with Abraham, Isaac, don't you believe it? God has still got his covenants uppermost with regard to the nation of Israel. All right, now then, let's go on to verse 6. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am. There's that same connotation. The I am is the I am is Jehovah. And I will bring you, the nation of Israel, out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will, what's the next word? Redeem. See, I tell you all the time, this is the book of redemption. Here it comes. God says, I'm going to buy you back. I'm going to pay the price to set you free from the bondage of Egypt. Now, remember that Paul, as well as other writers of Scripture, also speak of our redemption. We, too, have to be redeemed. Well, in fact, keep your hand in Exodus. Let's go all the way back to the little letters of Peter. And the easiest way to find them is just go to Revelation and then come back to the left a few pages, and you'll come through the little letters of John. And you come to 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 18. All got it? 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 18, where Peter now writes, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with silver and gold, from your vain conversation or your manner of living received by tradition. Now, you know, we often think of the Jews being steeped in tradition, but how about people today? It's no different. Oh, they're steeped in the tradition of the fathers, and they think they're going to make it. But listen, tradition isn't going to make anybody make it. And sometimes we have to break some traditions in order to come to the truth of the Scripture. But Peter says here that they were not redeemed that uh, according to the tradition of their fathers or with silver and gold. And then verse 19, but how were we redeemed? By the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. All right, now let's come back and what Paul says about the same word. And that would be in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Romans 3. Let's begin with verse, oh, I guess 21. More oh, here again. I'd, I'd rather go back up a few verses earlier, but we won't take time. Romans chapter 3, drop in at verse 21. But now, in other words, in verse 20, he's talking by the deeds of the law. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Nothing flies in the face of something else in Scripture. It all fits in that overall plan. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that, again, what does it say? Believe, plus nothing. There's anything else added. Of course, we always have to know what we believe. For there is no difference. Well, no difference between what? Jew and Gentile. And this is what got Paul in trouble with his Jewish people that he was maintaining there was now no difference between a Jew and a Gentile. And as we'll see back here in Exodus, as soon as God pulled Israel out of Egypt, what does he tell them? You're different. I'm going to make you different. I'm going to set you apart. 
And he begins that instruction then that they were not to have anything to do with the pagans around them. They were not to intermarry with them. They were to have nothing to do with them. And you see, this is why it was so hard for the Jews of Paul's day to suddenly come out of that tradition that they were different. And then to have this little Jew say, there's no difference. Can you see why it riled them? But this is the case. He says there is no difference. Verse 23, for how many have sinned? All, not just the Gentiles. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, whenever I, I come to Romans chapter 3, I always remind people that if you're going to be instrumental in, in bringing someone to a knowledge of salvation, and I think most of you have probably heard of the Roman road, those six, seven, or eight verses that you can use within the confines of the book of Romans to bring someone to a knowledge of salvation. Uh, they're, they're so easy to use. Well, I always say you start with this one. This is the very first step of faith on the road to salvation. And what is it? We have to realize we're sinners. Oh, you see, so many people think, well, I'm good enough. And there are a lot of good people. We were just talking about a little while ago. There are a lot of good people, better than I could ever hope to be. But they're going to be lost. Why? Because they have not trusted what God has done. See, and that's the only thing that you and I as believers can claim. It isn't what I do that's going to get me to heaven. Nothing can be done to get us into heaven. We have to rest on the fact that we're sinners. We've fallen short. We're sons of Adam. And so this is the first step of faith, to believe what God says about who? Me. <laughs> this is what God says about me. I'm a sinner. But this is what God says about you. We're sinners. We're sons of Adam. First step of faith. All right? Then verse 24. But even though God condemns us, we're already sinners, God has also declared that we can be what? Justified. And what's that next word? freely, no strings attached, justified freely by His grace through, and here's the reason I came to this verse, through the what? The redemption. The redemption, the purchase price that's been paid for the salvation of everyone if they will simply believe the gospel through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And let's not stop there. There's not a period. Go into verse 25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation. Now we'll explain that word more in detail when we get to the tabernacle in the book of Exodus. Because that's where the word propitiation comes into full bloom. So let's pass it for now. Through faith in His what? His blood. I wonder if now might be a good time. We, we had a good time in one of our classes the other night, and several people came up afterwards and wanted to know if I had that on tape. And I said, no. And I couldn't remember that we'd ever even covered it on the television program. So maybe this would be as good a time as any to take a quick look at this whole concept of being redeemed by the purchase price of God, which was His blood. Now, remember Hebrews says so plainly, and we won't take time to look at that, but I think I'm going to take a try if we've only got a couple minutes left. Go back with me to John's Gospel, and while you're looking for that, I'll remind you what Hebrews says. Hebrews says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sin. I mean, it's a mandate of God. Now, a lot of people may frown at that, that, uh, that this is a gory concept, but nevertheless, God is sovereign, and He can do as He sees fit. And for His own reason, He has demanded that there had to be the shed blood. Now, of course, the animal sacrifices, we're all looking forward to that. They were examples of it, but those animals' blood couldn't take away sin, but they looked forward to the one that could. And that, of course, was the blood of Christ. Oh, you got John's Gospel, chapter 20. Oh, yeah, we got time enough. John's Gospel, chapter 20. Here's the resurrection morning. And as the custom was, they anointed the body of the deceased. 
with herbs and spices even a day or so after they were buried. And remember, they weren't buried underground as we think of it. They were placed in a cave. And so Mary Magdalene, it says in verse 1, on the first day of the week, early, no doubt even before daylight, and when it was dark, she came to the sepulcher and seized the stone taken away. Now you all know the, what follows. Peter and John hear it from Mary, and what do they do? Boy, they run full speed for that sepulcher. And again, I get a kick out of Peter. He was bigger and clumsier than John. I think John was the athlete, and John got there first. But even more timid. But along comes blustering old Peter, a huffing and a puffing. I can just picture it all. And even though John stops at the door of the cave, which is now open, what does Peter do? Boy, he just bursts right on in and looks the situation over. Now, when timid John realizes that after all it's safe and everything is A-OK, -okay, John joins him in the sepulcher. And they look the situation over in these intervening verses. And verse 5, they look in, they see the linen clothes lying. And then here's where Peter comes and went on into the sepulcher. He too sees the linen clothes lying. Then verse 7, the napkin that was about his head. Then verse 8, finally John gets nerve enough and he steps in. And they saw, and then after they saw the evidence, what? They believed. Now up until this time, did these disciples believe that Jesus was going to rise from the dead? No. They had no idea that he was going to rise three days and three. They should have, but they didn't. And so now they see the evidence, and the Scripture says they believe. Well, anyway, verse 9, For as yet they knew not the Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So they leave. Now we pick up Mary. Now this is all in the pre-dawn darkness. And Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and sees two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Now, I always have to comment to my classes. See, all these things were so commonplace in Israel. What would you and I do if we go to the cemetery to visit the grave or decorate the grave of a loved one, and all of a sudden here was a bunch of angels standing around? Well, maybe you're a little more strong-hearted than I am, but I'm afraid I'd pass out. And I believe in angels, but I don't believe that they are making visible appearances in our age and time. It's just not happening. But see, this didn't shake her up. She saw those angels, and she communicates with them. And they said, verse 13, why do you weep? And she said, because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Now, I pointed out when we were talking about this the other night. Go back, keep your hands here. I think we can leave Romans now, but keep your hand in John and go back with me to Isaiah chapter 52. There's a couple of verses back here. I guess there are a lot of people don't know they're in here. In Isaiah chapter 52, beginning with verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee. Now watch it. His visage, this is a prophecy concerning Christ. His visage or his appearance was so marred <clears throat> more than any man and his form more marred than the sons of men. Now you want to remember, what did he go through before he even went to the cross? He went through the scourgings, which literally made a man's back like hamburger. He had the crown of thorns pushed on his head. He had his beard ripped out. And you don't pull a beard out without taking flesh with it. And so you have to realize that he hung on the cross, and the last picture Mary had of him was that. It was awful. Now, come back to John's Gospel quickly. <clears throat> now in God, John's Gospel, Mary looks at this person standing right there, and she says, knowing not it was Jesus, or he says, he speaks to her next in verse 15, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And she, thinking him to be the gardener, <clears throat> said unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, if you have taken him away, tell me where he is, where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And then verse 16, Jesus said, Mary 
Can't you just hear it? Oh, that voice of endearment. They had known each other so closely for three years. And she recognizes that voice. And now look what she attempts to do. Very human. She was just going to give him a bear hug. And what does Jesus say? He says unto her, touch me not. Now, you remember just a few hours later, he tells old Doubting Thomas to touch the wounds in his hands and in his side, so there wasn't anything that contrary. But here, he tells Mary, touch me not. Now, what's the reason? For I am not yet ascended to my Father. You see what it said? I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to the brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, to your Father, to my God, and your God. I call this the first ascension in Acts chapter 1, the second ascension. Now, if you'll come back with me to Hebrews, I think we can explain it. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 9. Now, in this chapter, Paul is rehearsing the Day of Atonement, where the high priest would go in on the Day of Atonement, first with the blood of an animal and sprinkle it back behind the curtain on the Holy of Holies or on the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, for his own sin. He'd go back and he would take the blood of the second animal, take it in behind the veil, sprinkle it on the mercy seat there in the Holy of Holies, that taking care of the sins of the nation. Now then, you drop down to verse 11. But Christ being come a high priest. Now, we have to have a high priest. Aaron was the high priest of Israel. Melchizedek, you remember, was the high priest of all as a picture of Christ, our high priest. All right, but high, the high priest Christ went by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. In other words, where is it? In heaven. And so into that holy of holies in heaven neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once, not just once a year, but once for all time, into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. What did he present in the Holy of Holies in heaven? His own blood. Thank you for watching. Now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to have everybody back. And once again, we'll just pick up where we left off and go back with me to Exodus chapter 6. And again, we want to invite all those of you watching us on television to get your Bible and compare all these scriptures with us as we hopefully compare scripture with scripture because that's the only way we can make any sense out of all this. And all only reason I teach, you know, I tell people all the time, uh, I only teach for one purpose, <clears throat> and that is to help people to understand what they read. And I think we're, we're making some headway. Uh, I had a young man again tell me the other night, he said, my, he said, how thankful I am that you finally came on the scene, because I never understood what I read. Well, hopefully, this is what we can accomplish, is helping you to understand what the book really says. <clears throat> all right, now in Exodus chapter 6, we left off at verse 6 where God speaks of redeeming the children of Israel out of Egypt. He's going to buy them back. He's going to pay the price as he has even done in our own redemption, you and I as believers in this age of grace. Then I'd like to have you drop down to, well, might as well take verse 7 and 8. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who bringeth you out from the burdens of the Egyptians. Now verse 8, those of you who have been with me now all the time, remember that Abrahamic covenant. He's going to make out of Abraham a nation of people. He's going to give them a geographical area of land. And then one day he's going to come and be their king. Now that was all in that Abrahamic covenant. And so here it is again. <clears throat> I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob. Now, those three names, you know, pop up all the way through your Bible, well into the New Testament, well into the book of Acts. And everything is based upon that promise that God gave to those three gentlemen. And he says, I will give it to you, that is the land, for a heritage. And the reason he can do it, he's the Lord, he's the creator, he's the sovereign God. And so Moses spake such unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not 
unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for the cruel bondage. Now let's drop down to verse 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron. Oh, I've got to stop here and correct a mistake I made in the last program. It wasn't her and Caleb. It was Aaron and her. I'll do that for sake of someone on television is going to be writing and telling me that I was wrong. And I, uh, I want to correct it before we go any further. All right. So now then we come down. Verse 13. And so the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron and gave them a charge unto the children of Israel and unto the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Everything is getting ready now. And now we're not going to go through those next series of verses giving all the names of the various tribes and the heads of them and so forth. But I do want you to see something in verse 26. These are, in other words, all these families are that Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their what? Armies. Now, not armies as we understand. They had no weapons. As I pointed out here some time ago, two or three programs ago, they were just like that locust I gave you an example of that was wrapped in that spider's web. They had no way of doing anything. They had no arms. They had no swords or spears or shields. They had no way whatsoever of overthrowing their Egyptian slave masters. They had to wait completely for the power of God to come in on their behalf. But I think we have to understand that even as you've looked back into the Holocaust and, and other aspects of Jewish history, they had a resiliency. And I think a lot of it was based on their tribal organization. And I think even here in Egypt, they had an organization so that they didn't have loudspeakers, they didn't have radio, they didn't have uh, phones in their cars and what have you. And yet, how did Moses communicate with those several million Jews? Through an organization. And he would just simply bring the heads of the tribes together and they would go out and just like a military command, it went down through the chain of command. And so never, never see Israel as coming out of Egypt in, in just a mob. Uh, they were organized. And again, when they get the tabernacle set up, as we'll be coming to it in future chapters, God organized in such a way that every time they set up camp, the same three tribes were on the east, the same three on the north, the same on the west, and so on and so forth. And when they moved out, they always moved out in the same order. They were a nation of orderly people. And I want you to remember that. Now verse 27, these are they which spake to Pharaoh the king of Egypt to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt, and these are that Moses and Aaron. Well, now we're going to come and confront Pharaoh, and I'd like to have you for sake of time now, come on over to verse 10. Verse 10 of chapter 7, where Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded and Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Now we're going to use the signs again, only now why are they using it? They're going to convince Pharaoh that God is the God of Israel. But now we got something interesting happen, and I think we're living in a time that we better see what the Scripture says. What has happened? Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, and now the magicians of Egypt, the sorcerers, those who practiced the occult, they drew their power from the powers of Satan. They come, and they also did in like manner with their enchantments, for they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. You see that? They had the satanic power to copy what Moses had just, or Aaron had just done with the power of God. But don't stop there. They became serpents, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Now, God is the creator of life. He is the sustainer of life. He is the very God of life. But Satan is not the sustainer of life. Satan is the sustainer of and the giver of what? Death. Sin came by death or death came by sin and the two are almost synonymous in the human experience. 
Death is on the scene every day because of sin. Sin and death are synonymous. Now then, let's see what happens uh, in that same connotation in our New Testament. Turn with me now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now don't forget what we just read, that as Aaron placed his rod on the ground and became a serpent, the Egyptian magicians threw their down, they became serpents, but Aaron's serpent swallowed up the Egyptian serpents. Now, what's the picture? New Testament will tell us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Oh my, we got to start with these exciting verses of 51 on. Verse 51. And we think we're getting closer to the day all the time. As you see, the world falling apart. Governments on shaky ground. Turmoil all around the planet. I got a kick out of some of the world's seismologists again the other day explaining the increase in earthquakes all over the planet. And they know there's a tremendous increase, but of course they don't know why. We do. The Bible tells us that there's going to be an increase in the number of earthquakes. And so everything is, is coming on. It's just piling up for the soon return of Christ, as Paul describes it here now in verse 51. Behold, he says, I show you a mystery. He reveals a secret. Now, you want to remember that nowhere in Scripture has it ever been told that there would be a group of people living, and of course, Enoch was a good example of it, but the Scripture gives no indication of a group of living people who will suddenly be gone and translated until Paul. And that's why he calls it a secret or a mystery. He said, Behold, I show you a secret. Jesus never mentioned this. The Old Testament never mentioned it, but Paul does. And so he calls it a secret. We shall not all sleep or die physically, but we shall all be changed. Now, the reason has to be, of course, we can't go to glory in this old body. Now, those who are dying and will experience resurrection, we can understand they'll have a new body, but what about us who are alive? Well, it has to be changed, and that's what he's teaching here. Now, I didn't intend to make this a point of lesson because I want to come to that which is later, but we can't pass over this lightly. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling or the blink of an eye. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and Paul says, we believers shall be changed suddenly. Why? Verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal, this body that is prone to die, must put on immortality. We have to be made fit for eternity in God's presence. We have to be given this new body. All right, now then, here's where I really wanted to come to point out what took place back there with Aaron's rod and his serpent and the other magician's rods and their serpents. Remembering that Aaron's serpent swallowed up those Satan's that were, uh, those serpents that were representative of Satan and his death. Now, verse 54. So when this corruptible, this body that we have that is prone to corruption shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, now look at it, death is what? Swallowed up in victory. Now do you see how it all ties together? as those serpents of the magicians of Egypt were writhing on the ground and Aaron's serpent swallowed them. It was the picture that this is exactly how God is finally going to control the situation and death is swallowed up in victory. Now, where was the victory over death accomplished? At the cross, see? At the cross. That's where Satan was defeated. And since Christ has now been put to death, has been buried in the grave three days and three nights, and he rose from the dead. That's the power that separates us then from the power of sin and death 
and Satan and what have you. Well, we could just go on and spend some more time on that, but we want to make a little more headway in Exodus before we quit. So I'd like to have you come all the way over now to Exodus once again. Exodus chapter 7 again. And now verse 13. Even in spite of what old Pharaoh saw happen, he hardened his heart. Now it says here that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now this throws a curve at a lot of people, doesn't it? They say, well now is God being fair with poor old Pharaoh that contrary to anything that Pharaoh may have wanted to do, God is making him become the rebel. Well, that's not the way it is. Come back, if you will, to Romans. I guess I should have left you back there when we were in the New Testament. Come back to Romans chapter 9, because after all, the only way we can do these things is search the Scriptures. Romans chapter 9. Come over to verse 14. Where Paul now writes, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Can God be unfair? No way. Verse 15. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but it all depends on who? God, who is going to show mercy. Now verse 17. For the Scripture saith unto who? Pharaoh. Here we go. Tying it all together. The Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, For this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. How many people, even on the earth today, in this age of spiritual darkness and ignorance, haven't heard of the Exodus. How many people even today don't know at least something about the plagues that came on Egypt? Well, just about everybody does. And out of it, God has intended that he get the glory, not the blame. See, now the human race is tending to say, well, that was God's fault. But that's not the way God intended it to fall. He wants the human race to realize his power, his sovereignty, and in it all, his righteousness, his mercy, see? All right, now verse 18. Therefore, <clears throat> therefore he, God, hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Now that, that throws a curve at us, doesn't it? Boy, that's hard to comprehend. Verse 19. Thou wilt then say unto me, Why doth he then find fault? For who hath resisted his will? In other words, Paul is asking the question, Well, if God is putting this guy in this kind of a position, then who is God to put the blame on him? Well, now let's read on, because I think Paul's going to answer it for us. Nay, verse 20, O man, who art thou that repliest, against God. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another vessel unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had before unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also the Gentile. Now, that's a tough one to explain. Don't think I don't know it's tough. Number one, God is sovereign, He is absolute in His power. We are in no position to argue what he does or why he does it. The Old Testament says his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, his ways are higher than our ways, and it's not for us to question. But I think realizing that God is righteous, 
You can be coming back to Exodus. Realizing that God is righteous, He can do no sin, He can do no wrong. He gives every human being that exercise of free will. Now, Pharaoh, when he was confronted with letting the Jews go, what could he have done? He could have let them go. But, you see, when God brought him to the point of making a tough decision, and I remember I uh, mentioned a couple weeks ago, what was basis to him not wanting to let him go? It was economics. He couldn't lose all that slave labor without ruining the nation, and it did ruin it when they left. So God brings him to a place of having to make a tough decision. And like the average human being, how did O'Farrell decide? In his own direction. He made his own choice. Now, as we come through all these plagues, after every plague, Moses goes back and says in so many words, well, now, are you ready to let the Jews go? What could Pharaoh have said? Let them go. But instead, what does he say? I'll not let them go. So, I think we see this even in the human nature today. When people are brought to a place of making up their mind for or against God and they say no, the next time it's easier for them to say no than it was the last time. In other words, their whole concept of rebellion grows and their concept of recognizing God's mercy gets smaller. And so this is why when people get old, now this is not in any way pointing a finger at the elderly, but as people get old and they get up into those 80s and 90s, and if they are still a rebel against the grace of God, it's hard to break through it. It is almost impossible because they have become so hardened. I know I've talked to a few. And, and you just can't get through to them. Sometimes you can. But usually it's so hard because every time that they've been confronted with that choice of believing the gospel and they reject it, it becomes that much harder for them at some future time to break down those barriers of resistance. And so it was with Pharaoh. Every time that Pharaoh would reject the offer to let Israel go, it was that much harder for him to say, let him go, and it was that much easier for him to say, I'll not let him go. So I think this is the only way we can look at the fact that God hardened Pharaoh was that he put him in this place of having to make a decision. And every time he made it, it just simply hardened his whole concept. All right, now then, we know that the plagues begin and we're not going to take them one by one because I think you're all aware of all the various plagues that came upon Egypt, except I'd like to make this comment. A lot of people can't believe the book of Revelation. They just can't believe that such things are going to come upon the earth. But you know what I always tell them when I teach Revelation? These things have all happened before. Most of what takes place in the tribulation in the book of Revelation are almost a reek run of the plagues on Egypt. Only in the tribulation it'll be worldwide in its scale, whereas here, of course, it was limited to Egypt. But listen, much the same is going to happen. You're going to have the great uh, influx of, uh, of locusts, demonic creatures. You're going to have all of the cosmic disturbances that were no doubt part and parcel of all these things. So if you can believe now, if these things happened back here in Egypt, then you shouldn't have any trouble believe, believing that it's still going to come on the earth once again. All right, now if you'll come on down through chapter 8 with me. Like I said, we'll, we'll skip some of these plagues for sake of time. And come down to verse 20. Now the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Now I've got to explain that, because I know I used to wonder, and a lot of people have... How did Moses and Aaron have such access to the king of Egypt? Well, I read, and I, again, I have to, you know, you have to depend on what other people write sometime. But I have read that had this been Babylon, they would have never been able to do it. The Babylonian kings would never allow someone to come before them except in their own court. But the Egyptians did. 
the Egyptian pharaoh was open to people to come into his presence. And so consequently, Moses and Pharaoh had no obstruction. I mean, Moses and Aaron had no obstruction when they wanted to come before Pharaoh. They came right into his presence. And so here they do here. And so the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up in the early in the morning, stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else, verse 21, If thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies or insects upon thee, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, and in thy houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of the swarms of flies or insects, and also the ground whereon they are. But now here's why I jumped this far. Now look at verse 22. And God says to Moses and Aaron, and I'm sure Moses and Aaron repeated it to Pharaoh, I will sever in that day. Now evidently the first two or three plagues struck the Jew as well as the Egyptian. But beginning with this plague, now what does God say? I will sever, I will set apart in that day the land of Goshen wherein the Israelites were dwelling in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there, to the end that thou mayest know. Now here it is again, God's proving his point. He is showing the Egyptians that if God can draw an invisible line around Goshen, that even the insects wouldn't cross. I mean, this is something. And he says, I will draw a line around Goshen and they will not have the flies. All right, that they may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Now verse 23, and I will put a division between my people, that is of Israel, and thy people of Egypt. Tomorrow shall this sign be a division, a setting apart of the children of Israel from those of Egypt. Now we're going to see this, as I said last half hour, I think, that all the way up through Israel's history, what is drummed into them? You're different. You're different. You are to be a set-apart people. You are the covenant people. You are to have nothing to do with those pagan Gentiles all around you. All right, there's a New Testament analogy. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians again, if you will. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, now Paul comes on the scene and he gives us the same set of directions. You remember Paul says in Romans chapter 15, I think it's verse 4, all these things are written back in the Old Testament for our learning. We're to learn from this. Now, just as sure as God put a separation between the children of Israel and Egypt, God puts a line of demarcation between the believer and the world. And God says, you cannot serve two masters. We're either going to serve one and hate the other or vice versa. Now look what Paul teaches then in 2 Corinthians. Verse 11, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Now this is the Apostle Paul just pouring out his innermost being, even though he's by inspiration. He says, you are not straightened in us, but you are straightened in your own innermost being. Now for recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be you also enlarged. In other words, have that same kind of a spiritual relationship. Verse, 13, uh, verse 14, be you not, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, be you not unequally yoked together with who? Unbelievers. We don't hear that much anymore, do we? We don't hear much about separation. In fact, I maintain this is exactly why Christianity has lost its power. The average person can't see any difference between the average Christian and the average person of the world. But God didn't intend it that way. Just as sure as he separated Israel from Egypt, he wants to separate you and I from the world. Now, like I said a couple programs ago, not that we're to be oddballs. We aren't to be just constantly asking for persecution by our actions. But the world should know where we stand. So he says, be not unequally yoked together to unbelievers, Come on down to verse 15. What concord or what relationship does 
the one that believe have with an infidel, see? And so all the way through, we have to be separated. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les. Here is Les Feldick. And good afternoon. It's good to have everybody here. And uh, for those of you on television, we want to again invite you to just be part of our class. This is an informal class. We don't claim to put on any, any airs or try to be theological. We're just going to teach the Word as we trust the Lord has revealed it to me. And uh, I tell so, so people so many times. In fact, I had a call from the Colorado off, uh, audience the other day. And uh, she said, you know what I like about your teaching is you don't just go by what men say, you, you try to go by what the book says. And I said, that's exactly. And I've always attempted to have this approach, even if people don't agree with me, if I can just get them into the book. And that's what happens a lot of times. If you kind of stir their nest and uh, you say some things that they can't agree with, at least they're going to get into the book and see why they don't agree. And then that, of course, many times brings them around to our point of view. So again, just remember, those of you out in television, this is informal. We don't hew to any denominational line. We just teach the Word as we see it. And we trust you'll be blessed by it. All right, now for those of you here in the studio audience, I'd like to have you turn to Exodus. I said chapter 12, I think. But let's go back for just a moment to chapter 10. Because uh, the last time we were together, we had more or less gotten to the place where Pharaoh was obstinately refusing to let the children of Israel go. And uh, God would bring in a plague. And I've always felt it wasn't necessary to spend a lot of time on the plagues individually because most people know at least a little bit about what took place in the plagues on Egypt. But I would like to make one comment about them. Always remember that if you don't have any problem with the plagues in Egypt, and most people don't, and again, so much of history now confirms the fact that Egypt indeed was in a shambles by the time the Jews left. They were destitute economically in every which way. And most people can agree to that. But when you get into the book of Revelation, they shy away and they just say, oh, you know, I just can't believe that things like that could ever happen. But always correlate that many of the things that took place back here in Egypt under the plagues will repeat themselves in the tribulation only on a worldwide scale instead of just local as it was here in Egypt. And another thing I always like to remind you about is that so many writers, secular as well as even theological people, will always try to somehow associate these events in, in the book of Exodus, the plagues and how these things happen. They try to associate it with natural phenomena that just happened to happen. For example, I was reading one yet just the other night. They said it's not unusual at all for waves of locusts to come into that part of the world. Well, that's true. But when God sent a plague on Pharaoh, it wasn't just a happenstance natural phenomena. It was a miraculous act of God. And uh, they'll try to explain away the, the parting of the Red Sea. And uh, I know many of you have read of it, and you've heard of it, that it was up at the shallower end up there near the Mediterranean Sea, and they went through water 18 inches deep. Well, again, the article I was reading the other night, he explained that away by saying, and of course the chariots couldn't be drowned in 18 inches of water, but again, that area of the world so often has great tidal waves coming in off the Mediterranean, and that could have drowned the Egyptians. Well, you see, that's all just... Excuse the term, but in my language, that's hogwash. That's just bilge water. Because all of these things are the miraculous, powerful working of an almighty God. And this is the way we have to take it. All right, now then, if you'll come back with me for just a moment. As Pharaoh is now coming under the pressure of all the plagues, and uh, he's trying to do some compromising with Moses, and I don't think we covered them in our last study, but I'll just touch on them. He, he offers three compromises. One I know we touched on, and that is, he said, well, now, if you want to leave, go ahead, but don't go too far. Now, what did he, what did he imply there? Well, don't, don't let yourselves go so far that I lose control of you. Go for a day or two, worship, and be right back. 
Well, you see, that's exactly how Satan deals with the lost person. The lost person may start getting an appetite, and the Holy Spirit may be wooing him and, and bringing him under conviction. And what's the first thing the old devil says? Well, you can get a little religious, but don't, don't get carried away with it. Uh, go ahead and go to church Sunday morning, but uh, forget about it the rest of the week. See, that, that's Satan's ploy even today. Then secondly, uh, Pharaoh comes back and he says, well now, uh, how many of you are going to go? He said, I'll let your men go, but I want to keep your children. And isn't that again exactly how Satan works today? Oh, you know, every parent loves to see their kid get the best of everything. We want to see them be successful. And uh, in our day and time, in this materialistic world we're living in, all we're doing is giving in to, again, the compromise with Satan. Well, yeah, I guess I'll let you have my kids because, after all, they've got to make it in this world. They've, they've got to do what everybody else is doing. But listen, that isn't the Lord's idea. That isn't his approach whatsoever. And uh, then, of course, uh, Pharaoh finally comes to the place where he gets so put out with Moses and Aaron. Now, if you'll look at the scripture with me, he says in verse 28 of chapter 10, Get thee from me. And uh, he said, Take heed to thyself, you'll see my face no more. For in that day that thou seest my face, thou shalt die. And it's almost enough to bring a smile to your face, Moses' response. Moses knew, because Moses, see, God had told Moses way at the very beginning that the last plague was going to be super special. And this, of course, would be the plague of taking the life of everything that was firstborn. And so when Pharaoh makes this statement now, Moses just comes right back in verse 29, and he said, Thou hast spoken well. Pharaoh, you've just said a mouthful. I will see your face again no more. All right, now then, we get into chapter 11, and, and God in, uh, encourages Moses, and he says, Yet I will bring one more plague upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt, and after this one he'll let you go. And, of course, we know that's exactly what happened. And he says down in verse 5, And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits upon a throne, even to the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of what? Even the beasts, even the livestock. Now imagine what that would do to a society or an economy. It just wrecks it. And uh, verse 6, God promises there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it, any more. And then verse 7, but against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move. Now, I know it's interesting that throughout Scripture we get little tidbits of information how that God is even in control of the wildlife or the animal kingdom. Now, here he's going to make sure that even an Egyptian dog won't bark when Israel gets moved out. And then that always takes me up into the New Testament. You know, when uh, Peter was concerned about tax money, what did Jesus tell him to do? Go down to the seashore and there will be a fish with enough money in it for your taxes and mine both. And what does that tell you? He's got control, even of the fish, of the animal kingdom. He is totally a controlling God. All right, so he says, even a dog against man or beast, verse 7, that you may know how that the Lord doth put a, what's the word? Difference. Difference. Now, a lot of times I repeat myself, I know I do, but I do it for a purpose because some of these things, they just don't sink in until we get it hammered and hammered and hammered into us. Now, all the way up through Israel's history, beginning, you might say, with Abraham, God is constantly reminding them that they are not like everybody else on the planet, but they're what? They're different. They are his covenant people. And they were never to intermarry with anybody but those of the nation of Israel. They were to have no real social contact with the pagan people around them. Naturally, they had to do business with them and so forth. But socially, they were to, re to remain a separated people. And I always like to emphasize, and this shocks people a lot a bit, never did God instruct the Jew to go out and proselyte the Gentiles. You know that? They were never instructed to go out and win the Gentiles even to their religion. 
And, and this is kind of hard to accept because, you know, we're of the opinion that, that God wanted those people. Of course he did, but he didn't want it by virtue of the Jew proselyting, per se, or evangelizing, because he was dealing strictly with this covenant nation of people who he is going to set aside and he's going to make them different. And now I'm saying all this to get you ready for someday when we get to the New Testament and when the Apostle Paul begins going to the Gentiles, how did the Jews feel about it? Oh, it upset them. See? Who in the world has the right to go to those pagan Gentiles? Well, now, we don't want to come too hard on these Israelites because of that. Because after all, for almost 2,000 years, God has been telling them and proving to them that they were different. They were his separated people. And it took them a long time to get that out of their system. And that's why, of course, uh, Paul and Peter in Galatians chapter 2 have the confrontation that they had because, see, Peter just couldn't get that out of his system, that he could go in and sit down and, and maybe have a ham sandwich with those Gentile believers up at Antioch. And so when his fellow Jews came up from Jerusalem, Paul says, what about Peter? Hey, you withdrew. And Peter went right back to that old mentality that, after all, Jews could not fellowship with Gentile. But you see, that's the beauty of the church. Now, in the church age, Paul especially emphasizes that there is now no difference. See? And all it all has to be brought back to the Old Testament, where now God says there is a difference. And let's not forget that. All right, now then, verse 8, <clears throat> And all these thy servants shall come down unto me, and bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow thee, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh will not hearken unto you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Israel out of his hand. <clears throat> now we're going to let Pharaoh go for a little bit. And we're going to come into chapter 12, which again is a benchmark chapter, I think, much like Genesis chapter 12. Because here we have the introduction of Passover. Passover. Now, we've just come through the Passover season, and if you've been reading your daily papers and other areas, you know that the Jews, the Orthodox Jews at least, and some of the other areas of, of uh, Judaism, have been making a, a big ado over Passover. They're still practicing it. They still cleanse their house of leaven from top to bottom. And uh, it all goes back to this institution of, Je of Exodus chapter 12. <clears throat> now let's look at it. Verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month, which is now the month that we call April, this month shall be unto you the beginning or the first of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. In other words, the Jewish calendar now is set up in such a way that April is the first month of their uh, religious year. You know, I don't like to use the word religious, but it's the best one that fits. Now then, verse 3, Speak you unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, the first month of your year, in the tenth day you shall take to them every man a lamb. According to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Verse 4, If the household be too little or too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. In other words, there is never to be a shortfall. There is always supposed to be enough. Now, it doesn't say so much about that which is left over because he tells how to deal with that. But they had to make sure that there was not a shortage. And, of course, the lesson is coming in just a moment. Then verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up or pen it up until the 14th day of the same month. Now, what you've got here, of course, is a beautiful illustration of whom? The Lord Jesus. Now, he too was, according to our Bible, without spot, without blemish, without 
sin. But in order to prove that he was spotless, in order to prove that he was sinless, how long did he minister? Three years. And so as this lamb was kept up for three days to be completely observed, the household was to look for any blemish, any sign of poor health, any sign of anything that may have been wrong with it. And if at, if at the end of those three days the lamb was whole, then they could kill it for the Passover sacrifice. Now it's the same way with Christ. He spent that three years up and down the land of Israel. He was under complete scrutiny by the religious authorities, more or less by the ordinary man in the street. He wasn't hidden from anyone, and yet no one could ever point a finger at him and accuse him of a wrongdoing. He was without spot. He was without blemish. He was blameless. All right, now then, after they had proved the lamb, then verse 7, <clears throat> they were to take of the blood and strike it on the two sides and on the upper doorpost of the houses wherein they would eat it. <clears throat> verse 8, and they shall eat the flesh in that night roasted with fire. Now here again comes that beautiful illustration of what his death on the cross really amounted to. The verse following says that they were not to eat it raw, nor sodden at all or boiled in water, but it was to be roasted with fire. Now the fire here, is, as I see it, was indicative of judgment. That just as sure as Christ went through the fires of judgment as he hung on that cross in order to bring about our salvation, this Passover lamb also was roasted with fire. It was not to be fixed any other way but this which indicated a judgment. Now you remember that even as we go on into Israel's religious experience, what happened to all of their sacrifices that were offered upon that brazen altar? Well, they were burned. They were burned with fire. It was the place where sin was being judged. Now, I know we're living in a day and time where we hardly ever hear anything about sin anymore. We don't even know what, what sin is. It, it's just gotten to the place that every man does whatever he thinks is right in his own eyes. You know, I was telling somebody just the other day, I'm always reminded of that last verse of the book of Judges. You might want to look at it and, and mark it down because it is so appropriate for the day in which we find ourselves, even today. The, the, the whole set of circumstances around us fits this verse or this verse fits us. Judges chapter 21 verse 25. And remember the book of Judges is the account of Israel's rise and fall, rise and fall. She would go down to the very depths of sin and rebellion and cry out for help and then God would raise up a judge and then he would bring them out of it and they'd be rather spiritual for a while and then all of a sudden down they'd go again and that, that's the whole account of this book. But as the book ends, verse 25, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You know what it was? It was almost anarchy. It was a, a spiritual famine, and Israel was destitute because there was nothing to guide them. And see, we're getting there so fast within our own social fabric. Uh, I have to feel that this is the problem of so much of our inner city, is that these kids are being raised with no direction. They are being raised with no restraint. And consequently, their attitude is, I can do whatever I want to do, because no one is going to make me account for it. And it's going to do nothing but lead us to more and more trouble as I, as I see the whole picture. All right, now then, if you'll come back with me to Exodus once again. They were to now roast it with fire, and they were to stand at the table as they were eating, and they were to have all their clothes on, verse 11. Thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's 
Passover. Now again, let, let's just get a, a brief picture of the Jews now. They're in Egypt and they're in their little huts of one sort or another, but uh, evidently they had a tent or a cabin door. And they were to apply the door to the two side posts and to the lintel. Now, I'm convinced that no Jew in Egypt understood what was going on here, but I am just as convinced that God already had the final picture in mind, and that was he was drawing an outline of the cross. Because he doesn't say just put the blood on the door. The implicit instruction was on each side post and on the door top, or the lintel. And then he says in verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods, plural, of Egypt, will I execute judgment. Now, I guess I haven't made a point of that, but you want to realize that every one of the plagues were directed against one of the gods of Egypt. In other words, God just proved that their pagan worship had nothing to do with him whatsoever. He could destroy them at will. And, and always remember that. And I've, I've stressed it ever since we've started our study way back in Genesis, that ever since the Tower of Babel, the whole human race, until Abraham, was saturated in paganism, in polytheism, in other words, the worship of many gods. And so when Israel comes on the scene as his separated, different covenant people, they are the only people on earth. Now, I know that at that time the populated earth was there along the Mediterranean area and on into the Middle East and maybe on out to China. But that, that area of the populated world, every human being except these now coming out of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are pagan worshipers of the many gods. Now that, that's kind of hard to swallow, but it's the, it's the truth of history that all these people of the world are steeped in paganism. And Israel alone is that little group, that little nation, that has a knowledge of the one true God. And I know the first thing we say, well, then why didn't God send the Jew out into those pagans and, and enlighten them? Well, he wanted to in time. But again, he's going to instruct them first. He's going to prepare them. And until they're ready, of course, he's not going to give them that permission. Now, there were exceptions, of course. You know, he sent Jonah up to Nineveh, that Gentile city. And uh, he certainly responded to Naaman, the Syrian general. But other than that, he has nothing to do with these pagan, non-Jewish people as he's dealing only now with the house of Israel. All right, so now on the night of the Passover, the death angel is passing throughout Egypt and it is killing every of the firstborn of man and beast. But verse 13, God says to the nation of Israel, And the blood that is on the doorpost shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood... Now, if you don't mind marking your Bible, underline that. Because that, that's, that's the crucial point. He doesn't say, if you behave yourselves. He doesn't say, now, if you've been living relatively sinless... He doesn't say, if you worship me in a particular way, or if you do this, he says only one thing, and what is it? When I see the blood. When I see the blood, what will he do? I'll pass over you. Now, if you can picture in your mind for just a little bit the gross darkness now that has come upon the land of Egypt, and yet up there in Goshen, every Jewish family has put the blood on the doorposts, as they were instructed. And as they, as the scripture said they would, as they heard, and, and even old Cecil B. DeMille, you know, in his movie Ten Commandments, he, he made that rather, uh, rather accurate. They could hear the weeping and the wailing and the mourning going on throughout the whole communities of Egypt. And yet every Jew who was behind that door with the blood applied was totally safe. They had nothing to worry about. They had nothing to fear. They were absolutely secure. 
not because of anything they had earned, not because of their goodness, not because of anything except one thing. And what was it? The blood on the door. Now that, of course, was an act of faith. If they didn't put the blood on the door, if they would have scoffed and said, well, now, wait a minute. What's three little globs of blood on my house door going to have to do with me? Seeing what God is able to do to the Egyptians. Would they have been safe? No. They would have also lost their firstborn. But evidently, because the scripture gives us no indication that any Jews were lost, but evidently every single Jewish household in Goshen had the blood on the door. And they were safe. Now, I haven't got time in this program. We're going to have to do it in our next half hour. We're going to be going into the New Testament, and we're going to see that you and I, as well, if we are under the blood, we're safe, we're secure. And, of course, I always have to qualify that. That doesn't give us license. Never does that give us license. But if we're under the blood, just as sure as those Jews in Goshen, they were safe. They didn't weep and wail and say, well, what if? I haven't been like I should have been the last week. And you know, they were sinners just like we are. But yet, the blood applied made them totally safe and secure. And uh, like I said, I haven't got time in this program, but we're going to, in the next half hour, we're going to go into Romans and Ephesians and some of these others. And we're going to see how that this whole exodus from Egypt was God's redemption of the nation. And it was based first upon a person, which was Moses in his case. And it was upon the blood, the Passover lamb in this case. And thirdly, the word is power. We're going to come to that in some future moment when the power of God is going to be exercised not so much now in all the plagues that have come on Egypt, but when Israel stands before the Red Sea and with no way out. And then what happens? The power of God moves in and the sea opens up. And that's why we have to, again, take for granted that it was not at some easy place of crossing, but it was where it was the deepest. And they went across on dry ground. Thank you for watching Through the Bible just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. And again, good afternoon. It's good to have everybody with us. And we want you to turn to Exodus chapter 12. Once again, we'll pick up where we left off. For those of you on television, we want you to just be part and parcel. I know there are a lot of people constantly writing to us that they have just now begun to watch our program. And so for those of you who have missed everything from Genesis 1 all the way up until the present time, all these programs are on VCR tapes. We've put 12 programs on a tape, and uh, we now have seven of them complete. And if you're interested in it, and the tapes are creating a lot of interest, you write to us, you call us, and uh, we'll be glad to get them in your hands. Now, for those of you, again, in the studio audience, and for those of you who are studying with us out in television, turn with me to Exodus chapter 12. And remember when we closed in our last program, we were explaining how that the blood was to be applied to the doorposts. And, uh, and then as they were preparing to leave, they were to ask the Egyptians for whatever they would give them for their journey. And of course, God had this all set up sovereignly because you want to remember they have been slaves now for many, many years. And God's going to see to it they get their wages, back wages. And he's going to cause the Egyptians to just literally give everything they've got to these parting Israelites with good wishes. Get out from our midst. You're nothing but a bunch of trouble. And so they spoil Egypt. But before that happens, I'd like to take you now into chapter 12, verse 22. And again, it's an important verse, I think, because here are the explicit instructions of how to apply the blood. They weren't just supposed to do it any old which way, but it had to be done in a particular way. And verse 22 of Exodus 12 says that they were to take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. Now, hyssop, of course, was a little bush or a little weed that grew everywhere in Goshen. 
I always like to liken it to the ragweed here in our part of the world. I mean, every place you look, there's ragweed, unless they have been rooted out. And they were to take this little weed and, of course, dip it into the basin of the lamb's blood and then apply the blood to those three places on the doors and on the lintel. Now, I like to liken the, the hyssop here to the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I may be wrong, but I, I think we've got a good application that as hyssop was everywhere, not a single Israelite could say, well, now, I didn't have a chance to find a little bush of hyssop. I couldn't do it that way. Neither can anyone ever say, well, the Holy Spirit never worked in my life. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. He works on every human being. And I am firmly convinced that every person that has ever lived, the Holy Spirit has given them opportunity to accept or reject God's salvation. And so hyssop was common. No Israelite could ever say, I didn't have a chance. Now, I know when I say some things, somebody is bound to say, well, where do you get that? <clears throat> so keep your hand in Exodus. We'll be right back. <clears throat> Go with me to the book of Titus. Way back in your New Testament, Titus chapter 2, because I always like to have folk understand that when I make a statement, that I hopefully can back it up with Scripture. If I can't, then it's just so much hot air and it means nothing. But here in Titus chapter 2, drop down to verse 11. Now, Titus is back with all the T's. They're all bunched together, the Thessalonians and the Timothys and Titus. Chapter 2, verse 11, where Paul writes to Titus, For the grace of God, the grace of God that bringeth salvation, hath, past tense, it's already been done, hath appeared unto how many? Oh. All men. Now, the Scripture doesn't lie. The Scripture does not lie. The grace of God, through the working of the Holy Spirit, has appeared unto, I think, every human being in one way or another. Now, Romans, of course, chapter 1 tells us that one way God does speak, even to pagans and those who have never heard the, the literal Word of God, is through the effect of nature. They should be able to look into the very starry expanse and realize that there's a Creator to deal with. That's what the Scripture says. But the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And uh, all of Scripture is constantly referring to that fact that even though all of sin, and we're going to be looking at that more in depth in, in not this program, maybe the next one, that even though all of sin, the way back to God has made been made available for every human being. In fact, go back with me now during the New Testament. Stop at John's Gospel. Thought just comes to mind of John's Gospel, chapter 10, the great new uh, shepherd chapter. The Good Shepherd chapter, <clears throat> John's Gospel chapter 10, where Jesus is speaking, of course, during his earthly ministry, and he makes such a perfect application of what I'm just speaking, that no one has been shut out from God's great plan of salvation. And he uses it here in the, in the area of a sheepfold and the sheep. Verse 1. Jesus speaking says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. In other words, he's saying you can't just pick and choose. There's only one way. Now read on. Verse 2, But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter, or the doorkeeper, openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. He calleth his own sheep by name, and he leadeth them out. Then drop down to verse 5, just for sake of time. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. And then verse down, or come down to verse 9, where Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be what? Saved. See? He's the door. Now, over the last 20 years of teaching, I've, I've asked this question over and over. Where is the door to the sheepfold? 
Now, even though you've never been to the Middle East and maybe not even an area of the world where you have any knowledge of sheep, but I think anybody can pretty well picture if you've got a, a place of safety for the sheep at night, which they call the fold, where was the door to the sheepfold? On ground level. It wasn't a hundred feet up in the air. It wasn't down in some cave. It wasn't across some raging river. The door to the sheepfold was ground level. Now, what's the analogy? So is our salvation. Salvation is always right at ground level. We don't have to climb a high mountain. We don't have to pay a million dollars. We don't have to shape up. And any of these things that so many people have associated with God's salvation, it's at ground level. And the Holy Spirit has, doing, is, has been doing His work, is doing His work, in order to bring us to the place that we walk through that door by faith. All right, now then, come back quickly with me then to Exodus chapter 12 again. And so after they have applied the blood, of course, the death angel passed through Egypt, and all the firstborn of beast and man are now lying dead, even in the house of Pharaoh himself. And so there was great weeping and wailing. And now if you'll come down to verse 35, after this last plague now, the stage is set, and the people, uh, the children of Israel, verse 35, did according to the word of Moses. They asked of the Egyptians. Now the King James, I know, uses the word borrowed, and it's unfortunate, because when you borrow something, what do you expect it to do? Give it back. And God never intended that. So it's a, a mistranslation, I think, in our King James. It should be they were to ask. They were merely to ask the Egyptians, do you have anything with which to send us on our journey? And they asked of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and the Lord... Now, see, God was instrumental here. The Lord gave the people, that is, of Israel, favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they, and again the word should be, they gave unto them such things as they required, and by doing it, they what? They spoiled Egypt. Now, don't lose sight of the fact that by the time we get to Exodus chapter 25, God is going to give instructions to Moses and Aaron to now build what? The tabernacle. And where are they going to get all the gold and the silver and the precious stones to build that tabernacle? Well, from the Israelites who have received it from the Egyptians. So you see, God isn't just spoiling Egypt to pad the pocket of the Israelis. He is looking for something that he's going to use himself in the building of the tabernacle. So now keep all that in mind until we get there. All right, now then in chapter 12, continue on in verse 37. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses, that's up there in the delta area of, of Egypt, up there in Goshen. And they journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, 600,000 on foot that were men besides the children and the women, of course. And then on top of all that, and fortunately, you remember I, uh, in our last taping, I used the figure that I was sure there were from three to seven million in this exodus. Boy, you know, the Lord always gives me comfort. Shortly after that, I was reading an article in the Jerusalem Post, and the rabbi used almost the identical figures, only I think he used three to five. And then the other day, some good lady sent me a... National Geographic, clear back from 1976, that was dealing with Moses and the Exodus. And the same figure was in there. I think it was two and a half million, all based on this 600,000 of footmen. But not only were there 600,000 young Jewish men, but in the very next verse, verse 38, what also went out with them? A mixed multitude. Now, I'll bet most of you have often wondered, well, who are mixed multitudes? Well, they were the hangers-on, probably a lot of Egyptians and maybe foreigners who had been laboring in Egypt as well as, as the Jews, but whatever they were, they were not Jews themselves. The mixed multitude were hangers-on who saw a good thing, perhaps, and they decided to go along with them. They are not so much in the spiritual realm, but as... What shall I say? I, I think they become something that, that is just like a parasite. And as you get out into the wilderness experience and they begin to murmur, you know who the first ones are to always start murmuring? This mixed multitude. 
And so I was telling someone sometime who was decrying that uh, so many of the churches today have got problems and so many are splitting and so many are, are having one problem or sort. And I couldn't help but I said, well, I said, you know, that really all goes back to the mixed multitude of Exodus. And they said, mixed multitude, what are you talking about? Well, I said, the mixed multitude were not true Israelis. And I said, I think most of our problems in our churches today, the murmurers and the complainers, are usually, not always, but are usually the unsaved element in the church. They have no real spiritual concern. They have no real spiritual knowledge. But you see, they can pick and they can destroy simply because the very good of the local body is not so much in their heart as maybe a little finer furniture, a little more beautiful music, a bigger organ. And you know, it's amazing how many churches have been literally broken over these secular things that, that really don't count that much. I remember years ago, a lady from a different denomination than ours was complaining to my wife at work one day that they were having church problems and they were about to split. And you know what it was over? The color of the upholstery of their pews. They couldn't decide whether they wanted gold or blue or whatever the case may be. But you see, that's mixed multitude working. The murmurers and the complainers. All right, now then, verse 39. They had baked unleavened cakes of dough. Now, I think most of you are aware that leaven in Scripture always speaks of what? Evil. Sin. But I like to use the word evil. Leaven always denotes sin. And you know, leaven is yeast. I think you all know that. And whenever you put yeast in bread dough, it is going to affect the whole lump. And of course, that's the teaching of Scripture. That whenever leaven comes in, evil, unless it is rooted out, it's going to sooner or later affect the whole. So now, leaven here, speaking of evil, was to be left out of their bread dough as they make this exodus out of Egypt. They were to take unleavened bread. Because the picture in type, of course, is that they are to be now a separated people, separated unto God, no longer wrapped up in the paganism of their Egyptian masters. All right, now then, verse 40 and 41, we alluded to this a couple weeks ago, that the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelled in Egypt was 430 years. Now remember that 430 years, as we taught it way back several weeks ago, was from the time that Abram, and his name was still Abram, had left Haran. After having come up the Euphrates Valley, maybe I better get my map up here again, and as he came down then into the land of Canaan and sojourned up and down the land, from that point until Jacob goes over to Egypt from Beersheba, From that period of time until Jacob goes is 215 years. And from the time that Jacob comes over here to Goshen with Joseph, uh, Jacob comes in with, with Joseph over here in Goshen is the next 215 years. And again, after the last taping, I read the Jerusalem Post and one of the rabbis' article used again the same, the same year's number, 215 years from the time that Jacob came in until, now look at the next verse, verse 41, and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years. In other words, from the time that Abram came down into Canaan with a promise that this would one day be his, or at least for his posterity, until Jacob is told to go on into Egypt is 215. From Jacob's coming into Egypt until the Exodus is another 215. Within a matter of six months? No. Look what verse 41 says. Even the what? Self same day. Now all I'm saying this for is so you understand that the Word of God is so true it is so accurate. God is in such complete control of time and events that he doesn't miss 430 years by 24 hours. But the exact day of the 430 years ending, Israel moves out of 
Egypt. All right, now then I'm going to come on as quickly as we can all the way over to chapter 13 where God now institutes the setting aside of the firstborn. And uh, that was always indicative, of course, of, of a family relationship throughout the tribes of Israel. And uh, after he establishes that, verse 18, well, let's look at verse 17. It came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that is, after the night of the Passover, that God led them not through the way of the Philistines, which, of course, would be up here in the short route. Here were the Philistines, right about in here. And so God didn't let them take that route, and that's why I know they didn't cross the Red Sea up here at the high point. But they come out of Goshen, and now I guess I'm getting too low to get the picture. But anyway, let's put the Sinai Peninsula out here somewhere. And the Red Sea comes up on, on both sides. And uh, now over here is a Mediterranean coast, and here's Goshen. Now they come down the shore of the Red Sea, and somewhere along at the very deeper part of this body of water, now over here will be Mount Sinai, remember, approximately. We don't know for sure. But somewhere in this area of the Red Sea, they're going to be locked in with mountains over here, there are going to be populated areas along the Nile here, and coming in from the rear will be Pharaoh's army, his chariots. Now I want you to get that pictured in your mind. The Red Sea is in front of them, forbidding mountains to the right, population to the left, and the armies are coming in behind. Verse 20. Well, now let's see, I, I, I skipped a couple of verses. Verse 18, But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. Now the top end of this body of water, where it's 18 inches deep, the reeds, that is not wilderness. That's populated. The wilderness doesn't approach until you get further down along the Red Sea. And so I'm convinced they had to have crossed down here at the deeper portion. And of course... It wouldn't be much of a miracle to go through 18 inches of water, would it? But he led them out through the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed. Now, what do you suppose that word's in there for? Harnessed. Well, stop and think. For three to seven million people to move completely out of one area of the nation and to be encamped clear down here on the Red Sea and ready to go through as the water part. Do you think that